All right. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to call to order the Monday, December 17th, 2018 Planning Commission meeting. <clears throat> Mr. Stoddard, are you calling the roll today? Uh, I believe I am, yes. Okay. <laughs> Let's do it. That's all we got. <laughs> Mr. Odiska. I am here. Mr. Rankin. Here. Ms. Dietz. Here. Ms. Ockenberry. Here. Mr. Grasner. Here. Mr. Stevens. Here. Mr. Puentes. Here. We're all here. Terrific. Um, <laughs> For the uh, adoption of the agenda, I would like to move items 6, A, and B uh, to after item 7 so that we can just hear from the West Falls Church Economic Development Project, about the Economic Development Project, and then we'll hear about the fellow's property afterwards, if that is okay. They're already at the table. Can I get a motion to move, switch those I'll items? move the agenda as amended or changed. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Terrific. That was unanimous. For your detailed notes, Mr. Stoddard. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, you going to kick it off here? All right, Rip. Uh, so, uh, for the Planning Commission tonight, there is a uh, presentation by the uh, EYA and the rest of the development team for the 10 acre site uh, over at West Falls Church. Uh, there is no formal application that's been submitted at this time, so, this is an informational uh, uh, presentation and discussion. Um, the application, as you all know, covers approximately 10.3 uh, acres uh, up at the West Falls Church site. Uh, currently, that area has the existing high school on it. Uh, in the timing section, you'll see how this is all going to work out, um, but I'll get to that last. Uh, just in summary, lines 36 through 51 of the staff report highlight the expected program of uses, the approximate program of uses. Uh, including a range of housing types, senior housing, uh, for sale condos, multifamily apartments, affordable housing units, uh, and then a range of other uses as well, hotel, uh, class A office space, uh, civic space, uh, event space, uh, and I'll leave uh, the details of that for the presentation. Uh, staff analysis is limited at this time. As I said, there is no formal application. The timing section I do want to talk about a little bit with the Planning Commission starts on line 171 in the staff report. Uh, as you can see in the staff report, there are multiple threads that are coming together in order to make this project uh, successful and get it to um, uh, the voting deadlines that it needs to get to. The West Falls Church Economic Development Site, the ultimate goal uh, for this is to get it to uh, uh, vote for the special exception entitlement phase by the end of May, May 28, 2019. Uh, and of course it's going through an appropriate public hearing process that includes referrals to the Ports and Commissions, Planning Commission, uh, and Council will have two readings on it. The zoning map amendment uh, was, uh, there was a positive second reading on the zoning map amendment, so at this point the future land use map and the zoning map are set to allow uh, the kind of development that's being discussed tonight. Uh, high school construction, uh, site plan submittal will come uh, before the Planning Commission shortly. Uh, and then they're expecting to start construction in July 2019. The start of construction on the high school is contingent on uh, acceptance of a development application for the West Falls Church site. Uh, and then the, the other thing that, the planning commission, that would be within the Planning Commission's purview is the small area plan. Uh, for this area, going all the way to the WMOD, uh, uh, where the WMOD crosses over Route 7 near West Street. Uh, the idea is to restart that small area planning process in March uh, prior to a final vote on the uh, West Falls Church Economic Development Site. The idea is to provide context for that conversation and that vote, uh, but the adoption of a small area plan would happen after uh, any action on the West Falls Church project to allow the small area plan to accommodate uh, what is approved uh, through the public process. All right. Terrific. All right. With that, I'll turn it over for more information uh, about the uh, West Falls Church discussion. Or do you need a mouse? Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, allowing us to give a presentation of the Planning Commission. 
Uh, for the record, my name is Evan Goldman. I'm a Vice President of Development and Acquisitions at UIA. And um, we have a few other members with us here today. Murphy Antoine, an architect and planner with Torty Gallus and Partners. And then behind us, we have Laura Schoenfeld from Pian Hoffman, uh, Kelly Whelan, and um, Wyndham Robertson from UIA, and uh, Karen White from um, Walter Phillips, uh, local in the city, you probably know her best of all. Um, so we're really happy to be here and appreciate your time. Uh, we're very excited about the project. We've been working on this for the past year and um, we're really excited to be accepted um, by the city. So uh, what I'll talk through today is um, a little bit about uh, what you probably have already, some of you have already seen and, um, you know, and answer as many questions as possible as we start preparing our SE application. Um, the Falls Church Gateway Partners team is, con is uh, consists of three development companies, uh, real estate development and owner, owners, I should say. So um, EYA, I've been around for about 25, 26 years. Um, in the DC market, we're residential developers largely and we create kind of neighborhoods um, all throughout the metro area. Um, we were involved in kind of the original Clarendon Market Commons project in Arlington, um, in Park Potomac, in uh, Montgomery County. Personally, I, before coming to EYA, had worked on the Pike and Rose project up on uh, Rockville Pike. Um, we also have um, P.N. Hoffman as our partner. They've got a not only a great residential background, but also um, office and uh, re office and um, hotel as well. And so that says Matt Steenhook. He's uh, Sean Seaman is uh, the head of development. He's been more engaged and the person you've been seeing in meetings uh, as of late, and um, and Laura. And then Regency uh, we brought onto the team because they're a national company with really good contacts and relationships with major national uh, retail tenants, which. While we hope there will be a good portion of the retail um, that will end up being local retail, we do want some national local uh, retail as well. And so their relationships there is really help, are really helpful. Um, they're also a public company, so they have access to um, equity to finance um, the retail portion of the project. Um, on our team is um, locally Dave Lasso from um, Baskin, Jackson and Lasso, Walter Phillips, our civil engineer, Torty Gallus, um, one of the top planners in the, and architects in the region, Gorev Slade on the traffic, uh, who worked with the city on the traffic study already and then Clark Builders Group to round out the team. So in front of you right now is, is the plan, um, and this is what we had submitted in our resubmission back in August, um, and I'll talk through it a little bit. Uh, we are modifying it slightly as we're kind of updating and refining our plan, and so you'll see something slightly different in the SE application, but generally consistent with this. And um, there were some key planning principles. Uh, for some of you have probably heard this already, so this may get boring uh, if this is the third or fourth time some of you have heard this, but um, <laughs> To be consistent, I'll repeat myself. Um, so the site obviously is, sits at Haycock and Route 7. There were some key um, planning issues that we were dealing with on the site. First of all, and probably one of the most critical is the slope of the site. Um, and so it's a little hard, probably don't recognize it as much with the big high school sitting on it, but there's about 26 feet of grade from Haycock up to that center retail street, um, which is almost two and a half stories of a building. So um, it's really a hill. Uh, and so that really forced us um, and to place the retail street where we're showing it on this plan. Originally, we had thought about a retail street that cut east to west from Haycock to the school and kind of brought people from the federal realty property to the entrance to the schools. Um, but with that slope, there wouldn't be room, there wouldn't be able to do outdoor cafe seating. You wouldn't be, it wouldn't be as comfortably handicapped accessible. Um, it'd be more difficult to tenant from a retail perspective as the, the grade of the site, site is so steep. And so that helped us come up with this idea of this really major retail gesture on that street that you're seeing. Um, and that also, I think Torty Gallus really came up with this grand idea of this major plaza um, or park space that runs up the center. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, we want people as they drive, walk, or bike on Route 7 to recognize that they've arrived at a certain location that's different and unique and distinct from other development along Route 7, to see that there's some act activity going on deep within the site to see that there's people gathered in open spaces, that there's retail, and that width of the street really helps to um, announce the development on such a large, um, wide, very fast road that is Route 7. And so that's part of the reason. Um, and secondly, it really creates a center commons, not just for the project, but for the community to gather. And that you know brings together the retail on both sides, but also creates um, these little kiosk buildings in the center that can, that'll make sure that they're attracting people to the park spaces. Um, so, so number one was making sure we had the retail street right and uh, dealing with the grade. Second was pointing the development towards the metro. And so the West Falls Church Metro is one of the best and probably less, least utilized assets of the city, uh, even though it's in the county. And so making sure that it was very clear where the metro was, 
um, for somebody who was trying to find it, it'd be easy for them to find it, whether they were walking, biking, staying at a hotel, uh, driving. And so setting up this street that will continue north towards the metro is really important. And whether we end up being the developers, the Virginia Tech parcel, or someone else does, or you know, we end up being the developers on the WMATA parcel or not, that gesture will be really important. And you can imagine that future development will continue with that concept. Um, and we'll show you an image of where we've already planned for that. So that was a second major uh, planning construct. Um, a third one was um, how we were going to interface with the high school. And so I'm sure you had all seen the prior version of the high school plan when there was a big field in that location separating the development from the school. And while we were figuring out how to work around it, we never loved it because it really was this big barrier between the development and the school. And it also was so big that it precluded us from putting a grid of streets in place that would connect all of those streets together. And so um, when the schools chose the current team and modified their plan to this idea with the big plaza in front of the high school, we really loved it. And uh, in very short time period, I think we had two weeks maybe or three, we completely revised our plan um, so that our second submission in, in August um, was this plan that you're looking at here that really thinks about how the development interacts with the school. And so part of that is the plaza itself and the way we've thought about the backside, which is also a front of the hotel and civic building. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then secondly, the garage space there as well and how that can become something that celebrates the school from a marketing perspective, from a art perspective, from a branding perspective, and not um, a barrier, or not, not a kind of a surface level parking lot, which isn't the best use of urban land. Um, the other construct that's really important here is phasing. And so there's been many projects built over time where you get one building, and then it sits for a few years, and one day you get a second building, and then you know it's 10 years before you get the sense of place or the retail, and the project finally arrives and lives up to what you had expected. Um, it's pretty critical to deliver that sense of place all up front in phase one. And so there's, you know, if you think of city center in D.C., what, what happened with the wharf, um, they're great examples of doing something on a major scale where you really transform the neighborhood up front in that first phase. And that takes a certain critical mass of retail um, so that the retail can thrive and be successful. It takes a certain critical mass of open space and linear frontage and enough walkability that people feel like they can come, park, or, or bike here, walk around for a few hours, eat, hang out in the park. And so this development, by having all this come up at once, uh, delivers that sense of place and excitement in one phase. In order to do that and not to deliver, you know, a thousand residential units in one big phase, um, which also isn't something the city wanted, we came up with this idea of breaking up all the blocks into different uses. And so none of them are competing with each other. You know, an office building across from an apartment, across from senior housing, across from a condo, hotel, all of those can absorb in the market at their own pace that's appropriate for them um, without competing with each other. And so they can also be financed in a similar manner. So the, the people giving us the equity and the debt for the project aren't worried about um, their project competing with other projects. So that large phase one um, is the, the kind of last construct that we uh, paid a lot of attention to in designing the site. Um, the project is, uh, the, the, right now what it's, what's proposed is the bottom right is approximately 300 apartments. Um, smaller units, largely studios, one bedrooms and twos, uh, some two bedrooms. Um, we expect it to be kind of a younger demographic um, uh, given the proximity to the metro. And that will hopefully encourage people to get out of their cars and take the metro um, as often as possible, even if they have a car for weekend shopping. Um, across from that is um, an office building, a minimum of 125,000 square feet. Uh, just to the north of that is a senior housing building that we've assumed is about 150,000 feet and we're talking to potential senior housing partners at this point um, who are in that range of 150 to 225,000 square feet, depending on how many units they want to do there. Um, once again, to the north of that is probably the most exciting building is the hotel and civic, um, civic center. And um, essentially on the, the hotel itself um, is, is kind of a, a nice select service hotel with a, we've, we've, um, we have some brands that were in our RFQ that I can't quite talk about yet, but hopefully we'll be able to shortly. Uh, but it's a, a nice hotel, it'll be a nice addition for the city. And then it's attached to a music venue. And so that civic music space is retail on the first floor and a music venue on the second floor with an outside deck um, that can have music as well. And so the concept there is for the hotel to have access to this um, event space, for the city to be able to rent out an event space that's large enough to attract you know, 500 people for a sit down dinner, but then that space isn't just sitting empty most of the year, it's being used for music events, it's being used for um, programming. 
on the first floor of that building facing the high school on that plaza is where the music school that we've been talking to would go. And so we're negotiating a letter of intent with the music school. They would be, they like the synergy of being underneath this music venue. They would partner together. Um, and so that allows the music school to save a little bit of money by not having to build its own large recital space because they can use that um, music venue as needed. And then they would have a smaller recital space inside. They also have a potential opportunity of working with the high school and middle school across the street, which have some spaces as well. And as part of that, we thought about, you know, what does that high school plaza want to be? And is there a theme within that plaza that's music oriented? Are there, you know, Saturdays where some of the kids are out playing in the park, music in the park, um, or opening up, you know, windows and people can hear the music wafting out into the open space. So I think there's some really cool opportunities at the ground level for how the music can actually interact with the school itself and the, and the plaza there. And that's part of placemaking. It's, you know, bringing people to a space to see something really cool. Um, and then finally, on the upper right, we have um, some condo parcels and um, a future office building as well. The in total phase one is approximately 925,000 square feet. So it's pretty big. Um, it'll be about $330 million. So it's a, a hefty investment, which will be great for the city. <laughs> this image kind of shows the potential for a larger project here um, beyond the city site. So the city site's fantastic. Um, if there's coordination between Virginia Tech and WMATA, there's an opportunity for something larger. And so this is 35 acres. Um, give you a sense of scale. It's uh, roughly the size of Mosaic. It's, um, it's pretty big. Um, and so with that in mind, you can see how we're continuing that retail Main Street. I can, oh, the cursor works, good. You can see how we can kind of continue the retail Main Street all the way up to this intersection um, and then cross it with retail as well as it goes back towards the metro. The, this is very preliminary and, um, you know, we don't know ultimately where the metro is going to go uh, from a design planning perspective, but the design that we've selected for the high school sets it up for this type of development. We are one of two uh, teams that have been selected for Virginia Tech. And so uh, we do hope in the next six months to have more information as to whether we'll be the developer there. Um, and the concept there is kind of student and faculty housing on the left side um, and then academic buildings on the right side and, and hopefully a, a, a bigger investment in this campus uh, along with retail on the ground floor. Uh, this is an overall perspective of the site um, and, and this architecture was a little bit of a placeholder. We, you know, we haven't gotten into full design of the buildings yet, but it gives you a sense of scale of some of the buildings, uh, the concept of green roofs, uh, you can see the outdoor space next to the music venue. So this is the music venue here with the outdoor deck um, to the left of it that kind of spills music over out onto the main street. The hotel is behind that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, and then senior housing and office as you go out towards Route 7, which is back here. And the little kiosk buildings in the park. Um, whenever you show kiosks in a rendering, they have to be ice cream. So <laughs> <laughs> that's required. Um, and so what you're seeing is ice cream. Um, but that, once again, ice cream is actually a perfect use for these types of spaces because it brings people to the space. Coffee. coffee is also great, exactly. You want something where wine, right. wine is good too, right, exactly, as long as they don't run into the street. Um, but no, it's, they're, they're great uses because they bring people there regularly. It's something you go on a regular basis. You'll sit outside. You go as a family. Um, and one of the <laughs> ideas for this development that Regency, our retail partner, has thought about is, um, you know, family-oriented retail. We've got the high school. We've got the middle school. Um, a lot of retail companies would kind of fear the high school and middle school that these kids are going to be rambunctious and, you know, they're not going to spend money in the stores. And I think Regency saw it in a different way, that, that Falls Church is a very family-oriented place, and so to the extent they can pick up on that um, and make this the place for families in the city, um, there ac actually could be the right type of retail mix and a benefit for everybody. Um, and that, could, that would include restaurants and coffee shops, a grocery store, um, and other users. On the left of the block, you can't really see it, but those are the condo and, and apartment buildings. Um, and just, you know, from a planning perspective, it's probably important to know this, this rendering is not showing it, but these streets will be set up in a way that will work from a fire access perspective. So there's bike lanes to the right in the right portion of those drive lanes. So you have a 11 foot drive lane, four foot bike lane um, on each of the, each direction. And then you would have spaces throughout that site where it would be curbless. And so if the fire truck needed 20 feet, they can come in and put down their um, support uh, Outriggers, I can never remember that word. It's terrible. Um, they can put down their outriggers and set up in case there's a fire. And so that's a kind of a, a, a neat trick we've done in other jurisdictions where you can kind of solve, you know, not have to have 20 feet of paving um, and still make it work for, for the fire. Um, so that is the intent there. 
This is an image looking from inside the park space itself. Uh, it's a beautiful day. It's about 75 degrees. <laughs> Everybody's happy. No rain. <laughs> There's no rain in the, in the forecast. The birds are flying, exactly. Um, it's, but it's that nice cloudy. It's the heat island benefit cloudy. So um, anyway, but what you're seeing in the distance on the left is the music venue again. And as I said, that's probably the most special space in the project because it's a four-sided building and it addresses both the school as well as the um, open and public spaces. <clears throat> This is a, a, we'll get into more detail on this for now. This is, gives you a sense for this idea of special paving patterns inside of that park space. Um, large enough green areas where you can have, um, you know, yoga in the park or movie night or, you know, large gatherings. Um, we've designed the site so that the, this part of the project could be closed down to traffic and the garages will still operate from the other streets. So you can have arts festivals, you can have, um, you know, citywide festivals here as well. Um, at Pike and Rose, we did a really cool Oktoberfest every, every October, which was the restaurants would each come out onto the street and have food and vendors and, um, and uh, homemade beers and other really fun stuff. So there's the ability to really make this a special space or kind of a public living room for the city. Um, and we'll obviously work through at site plan level, work through this in detail with all of you. Um, but that, that concept of this being a special space with raised intersections and really pretty and attractive and safe for pedestrians. Um, yeah. What is the, on the top right, what are they, this is showing the retail? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, That's yes, the, thank you. Um, so, right, so this is showing kind of the red areas are showing all the frontages, red and brown, this is the grocery, all the frontages that have retail. So most of the street frontages are retail oriented. <laughs> um, this doesn't show the music venue and the hotel on the backside here, sorry, the music school, which would also be retail oriented. Um, and even where there is not retail, the, the spaces will be treated in a way that feels residential or feels, you know, um, appropriate as it addresses that the street. Just those noticing it's fronting seven on that. Yeah, exactly. So right. this portion, we'd have to see if there's, given the new design and fitting the garage that works for the school, I don't, we'll see if this piece still fits, but the idea is to have uh, retail wrapping all the way around there. I think some places would be on seven. Right, yeah. right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah. In fact, our, our problem is one of our developments was, was on Maple Avenue Pearson. Uh -huh. That retail, which was very nice, was hard to fill because people felt like it was not close enough to 29. Right, exactly. I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah, that is, so. The, and that's part of the reason we made that really big major uh, gesture with the Main Street here because we, we need the retail to be successful as you go deeper and away from 7. But we also recognize that the visibility on 7 is huge. Yeah. Um, it brings, put, brings people in. Mm -hmm. Well, and if you put some store, some of these kids have quite a bit of money to spend. Right. <laughs> it's so funny. That's exactly what my daughters would say. I have a, I have a 13-year-old and a 10-year-old daughter, and they love Sephora. I took one of the Girl Scout trips to Manhattan um, just overnight, and we went to five different Sephoras. <laughs> I bet. We didn't want to. They just kept saying, there's another one. Let's just go in this one, too. <laughs> yeah, so it sounds like we should put Sephora on the list of potential tenants here. <laughs> I'm just telling you. And um, also, one of the things I immediately think of is our kids being able to get jobs. Uh -huh. Our businesses here in the city have been extremely mm -hmm. generous uh, with giving our kids jobs, particularly in restaurants and everything. Yep. And it's worked out so beautifully and, you know, gives them an opportunity. You know, I don't know where these kids find the time to work on a job because they're just crazy busy always. Mm -hmm. but. I just think it's wonderful. I agree. Yeah, it's a good life lesson. I started working when I was 14, so. It's nice and safe. They can walk. They're close to home. Awesome. Cool. Um, so, yeah, but most the idea is most of those ground levels to be, <coughs> ground level spaces to be activated so people feel safe when they're walking on the street. There's lights building out onto the sidewalk. Um, you can also see that we have different heights for the buildings, um, and so even though there's a 15-story height limit here, the vast majority of the buildings will be below that. There might be one or two that get close to that. Um, and, and most of them won't be. Uh, this is a slight update on the plan, and so obviously this will one day be as pretty as the other plan, but you can get a sense from a conceptual perspective. Uh, some of the things we're doing is kind of breaking this block into four instead of three. Um, it kind of allows us to do these twin residential buildings um, that can be phased. The senior housing, this is an idea. This may or may not get approved, but the idea of kind of hiding the garage with some senior housing um, is a possibility. Although the image that I'll show you of the Mustang on that side of the garage fronting the park is also kind of cool, so <laughs> we'll, be, we'll see what happens there. Um, it makes it a little bit of a less efficient building itself, um, but it does provide for views into the park space, which is really nice. And that garage is not something that has been 
approved yet, the school board is considering it as an opportunity. Um, it may end up being surface parking, and if it is, our parking would go below grade. Um, this is, uh, we brought in these images, and this was really Torty Gallus did a bunch of research. The concept for the garage, and part of the reason we're excited about it is to use it as art, um, and kind of art spaces, public art, um, in coordination with the school. And so, you know, whether it's banners that get placed on the building, or it's literally physically art on the building, or it's ceramic tile art on the building, we think there's a way to incorporate um, really pretty imagery on the garage itself. Um, and so you're spending your money on the placemaking versus the, you know, the garage um, structure. And, um, you know, there are places, my kids go to a school where every year the, the graduating class, I think the 11th graders actually, do a ceramic mural that gets added onto and it talks about current events um, that happened during that year, but it also always has a theme that's relative to the school. So you could see something here where the school, we work with the schools and on a regular basis, they're kind of adding onto the art on a continuous annual basis. Um, and so the, the garage really becomes part of the school and you come back 10 years later and you look for your mural or the, the mural that your class may have dedicated. So that's one concept. <coughs> uh, can be done with banners too. It doesn't have to necessarily be direct art on the building, which could be easier for installation. Um, and then, you know, Torty Gals took this initial idea of, you know, do you do something that really celebrates the brand of the school itself? Um, with, you know, the Mustang uh, fronting the high school plaza and, um, and for Mary Ellen Henderson School, their mascot as well. Um, and that really announces the schools. There, was, uh, there were two things we've heard a little bit about. One is that both schools want their distinct brands to oh, really yeah. be clear that it's not just one building. It's two different campuses, uh, two buildings on a campus. And then secondly, this idea of really announcing the school entrance on 7. So, you know, to the extent we have a tower element with something really big that everybody knows where the school is, it can help with wayfinding, it can help with the school's image. Um, so anyway, so those are some very, very early preliminary ideas that we'd want, you know, feedback from over time. And then getting to the last few slides are about placemaking. And, you know, I think this was one of the main reasons I think our team ultimately won was that we have a lot of experience in placemaking. And there was a desire for this, what we had heard from the city was this desire um, for this to be a, a space and a place and really great um, and not just another project. And so that takes coordination, it takes planning. Um, and so all of us, EYA, my experience at Federal Realty, PN Hoffman, Regency, we all have experience doing that. Um, and we will always partner with the jurisdiction. So um, Falls Church's Economic Development Office, whatever other groups within the city regularly want to be doing things, that's the type of, those are the perfect people that we'd coordinate with. So this is not meant to replace you know, what anybody else is doing, it's meant to just help it. Um, but then we'll also coordinate with retailers on site for certain days. We'll, you know, ideally what you'd have is, you know, one or two regularly planned events a week, um, bigger things once or twice a month. Um, you know, whether it's the first Friday of every month, everybody knows to come for something. You want it to be a regular enough cadence that everybody comes back for these regular events and they become part of what just the community thinks of as part of Falls Church. Um, and so we would work with the city to come up with some really good ideas for what right. those might be. One of my dreams with the school of music is, and with the high school is to have music on every corner. Yeah, that's really cool. You know, that would be just so awesome be, mm -hmm. uh, for performances and everything. It just makes a very interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, it really is true in that the high school plaza sets up really nicely for that. You have the music school, the high school right there. Um, you have the music venue on the main street. Um, and so, you know, you could imagine partnering with the State Theater and doing a jazz festival in Falls Church where multiple venues throughout the city have different activities going on the same weekend, and so people kind of come to um, see a certain genre of music. Um, so this could, it could get really fun and creative over time and not just be about this project. It could be about the bigger city. And we do and have a blues festival. There you go, here. exactly. Um, new, so that, new place. This is about materials as well, and so... Um, it's important in these projects to kind of pick the spaces where you want to invest the most dollars on materials so that they really shine. And you don't want to kind of, if you do it everywhere on the site, you end up typically with a lower level of quality everywhere versus doing a high level of quality in the most important spaces and then doing a really nice level in the other places but nothing over the top. And Pike and Rose, I think, really exemplified that. Most of the sidewalks at Pike and Rose are, um, you know, a nicely scored concrete, um, very pretty, a light gray and a beige. Um, but then when you get to the special spaces, you have beautiful pavers, you have really beautiful landscape. Well, landscaping was beautiful throughout. Um, water features, all the types of things that bring things bring the space alive. And so Everybody that's... Everybody about the trees and what you said on Sunday. 
Yeah, so street trees are really important. That was, and it came out of a question about heat island effect. And so this whole plaza sits on grade. And so we have the ability to have, you know, real full growth trees there, um, ultimately, not to, you know, not little teeny spindly trees above parking. And so um, it also allows us to think about larger caliper trees initially. So you can have um, trees that on day one feel, you know, bigger than those teeny little Christmas, uh, I, I use the phrase, uh, the Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Um, and that's important. I mean, you want, you want on, it's going to take a few years for the landscaping to come in and mature and feel great, but you do want as much as you can in that first year um, for it to feel um, intentional and large. Go for it. And, and the boulevard gives you the opportunity to do four, five, six right, trees across versus just two sides of the street. And you can get different levels of canopy in different sections. So we're excited about that opportunity as well. Well, that's key to keep people coming in the summer when it's so hot. It's exactly. Yeah, and also, you know, and, and then you have twinkle lights at Christmas time, and you have, you know, you do things that make the trees part of the feature of the project as well. Mm -hmm. um, Nobody knows how hard it's going to get twinkle lights. <laughs> <laughs> Is it really hard to get twinkle lights oh, on trees? Oh, it took us a long while. Okay. And so now we, it looks really pretty down there. It really it does. 100, 200 block, but that took... Forever. <laughs> These are hard to maintain, but to even the act of putting them down there. Would yeah, and so here the nice thing is this would be maintained privately. Um, right. The project itself would pay for the Christmas lights. They would be doing them, putting them up, and taking them down. <laughs> uh, so that could help. Um, but it really is. It's and I'm Jewish, so Christmas isn't. You know, even though I'm Jewish, I love Christmas lights. So <laughs> that time of year, it's you know, it's really special when you come to spaces that are lit up in the right way and have a certain decor that's really unique. Um, and whether it's Rock Center or Pike and Rose, we have this beautiful star that we have above the main street. So, um, and then lastly, um, just thinking about how we can activate, you know, even little things, branding, naming, you know, everything from, uh, you know, the covers, how pretty the sculptures are, to the street furniture. Uh, landscape furniture is really expensive. I mean, sorry, really important. Um, and it can be expensive, but it is, it is expensive too, but it's really important. Um, and so the, you know, the right rocking chairs, the uh, movable furniture so people can own and personalize the space um, is, is extremely important as well. When things are bolted down, they just don't feel like you have ownership over it. Um, in this particular scene, which is from the wharf, uh, there's firewood and there's a fire pit in the middle. And so, um, you know, you can sit around a fire pit. I think, do you guys hand out blankets there? Is that right? Or s'mores or something? Uh, you can buy s'mores. So they're like little touches. Um, Pinstripes is a really cool bowling place. I don't know if you've been there, but there's, uh, they're in Georgetown and in Montgomery County. And they're started in Chicago where it's so cold, and they have these beautiful outdoor spaces, and they actually go around and hand out blankets so people will sit outside and also cook s'mores and you know, have a drink. So being intentional and thinking about how each of these spaces could be used is um, you know, part of what makes places special. But those wood containers are beautiful. Yeah, it's really cool, they're isn't it? They're pretty. Yeah. We do have someone who's tending the fire. We don't, it's not like adding on <laughs> <So> <laughs> You don't just go at 2 in the morning and set up a fire because you're cold. Um, and, and that middle one on the, on the bottom is from Pike and Rose. That's, those are little, so just to give you a sense of placemaking and what we would get into here, um, Montgomery County has a really big birding history. The Audubon Society was founded there. Uh, the Grosvenor family, which is the original Audubon Society family, has a mansion right near Pike and Rose. Uh, it's one of the biggest birding routes. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff about birds. And so we actually created these really cool little mini bird sculptures uh, that spit water, they're fountains. And so, you know, an average person is going to walk through the site and have no idea that that has anything to do with the history of the county. But uh, those are the types of surprises we would work with the city to understand the city's full history and then what are the pieces and spaces that make sense to kind of celebrate that to those who know the city best and for, it to, for other people just to be a nice surprise. So that's, anyway, that's the overview of the, uh, of the project. And... Um, just you know, we're obviously early on in this process, but we'd love any questions you might have. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm definitely one of those people who have seen this many times, uh, and was on the committee to uh, the selection committee, and uh, it's really exciting to have you come before us and to show this presentation and uh, really to share. I know you've been out in the public. Uh, constantly mm -hmm. um, but uh, <laughs> but they sh show it to the Planning Commission so we can begin to have a dialogue about it right. uh, I think uh, a lot of what you're saying now is or almost all everything you're saying now is consistent with what we heard during the selection <coughs> committee there's a lot of uh, elements here that uh, helped make my decision uh, personally and 
it is this sense of place making. It is confidence in your team. Uh, uh, I think this is going to be a transformational space for the city. Uh, I like a lot of the other elements just on the business side of it. I, I'm really pleased with how much office space has been included here. Uh, I have a really good understanding of what you've presented. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to the rest of the commissioners to sort of ask their questions and see if they have something <coughs> to. Well, uh, I don't have any questions, but just a couple of comments. It's, it's certainly good to see the experience and the creativity mm -hmm. that should be put into this. Uh, it's, it's very evident. Uh, one aspect kind of reminds me a little bit of the city center in uh -huh. D.C., where uh, you know a lot of busy highway on the outside, so you know things are kind of focused on the inside as far as walkability and the restaurants and the other forth. And it seems like you, you know, tried to do that here because obviously Broad Street and Haycock are very busy streets, and right. it's hard to create a you know kind of a, a good good sense of uh, out, outdoor dining and that sort of thing you know there. So I'm glad you're kind of focused on the. Uh, opportunity to, to emphasize the, the central part. The other thing is I kind of like that you varied a lot the uh, the look of each of the buildings mm -hmm. so that it doesn't look like 10 acres of all the same buildings. And so you yeah. kind of kind of buffered some of that artificiality by incorporating, uh, you know, kind of unique uniqueness in each of those building uh, facades. So, uh, so it's very appealing. Great. Yeah. Oh, so what is your concept for the office space? Is are these going to be rental buildings, condo buildings? Are you looking for larger um, tenants or? Yeah, these would be rental office, um, kind of a it would be a class A office building, so a twenty thousand square foot per floor. Um, we would be looking for you know major anchor tenants, smaller tenants, who are, you know whoever's interested. Um, and P and Hoppen had the most experience with this at the wharf, where they. You know, I think people, a lot of people thought you couldn't create an office market down there because it, you know, had been not that great a part of town for a long time. Um, and not, and I don't mean that, I just mean from what it looked like, it was kind of, uh, you know, along the water there. And so they really created a market by creating such a wonderful place, and then that's the concept here, too. Um, right. We think we can compete for tenants with other markets in the area with the right design. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I know people, when, like in the Tyson's area, are unhappy with how that's gone in terms of development, so there's a chance to pull people from there. But have you considered condos at all, office condos? I just say this, I'm a business owner, and, uh -huh. and so we've had, we own our, we own a business condo. Right. And, and that's all we would look at because right. of the build out for it. But um, So it's interesting, so the cities, in, as part of their RFQ, they were really pushing for a ground lease, which is, would preclude condos. That's right. Really typically you'd have to rent. So the only buildings were, we've been able to get the idea of fee simple is the residential condominium bu buildings where there will okay. be condos for sale. Um, so yeah, so I, 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 I wouldn't imagine those going condo. I think they would be rental office. Okay. It's just, it's a, it's a real gap we have in the city. Right. Um, I mean, I think one thing I think that um, I know is going to come up and I'm sure the team's been looking at it is the, the traffic engineering of the project and adding a million square feet plus mm -hmm. to an intersection that is already, you know, at F, level service F in the right. peak, and adding this kind of uh, density here, uh, I think it's, you know, I think it obviously needs to be addressed. I mean, I'm, I'm as excited as everyone else in the city, but I also drive through this intersection every day. Right. And so do, you know, hundreds of thousands of other folks. And so the question becomes, um, right, you know, what has been proposed as far as, because right now it already, you know, one of the key issues I think is the, Access into the giant, you mm -hmm. know, and how that that and the pedestrian crossing with the crossing guards in the morning right. and the afternoon, um, you know, it's close to the intersection. It it, it backs up traffic. Um, so adding all these additional trips. I mean, as, as I mean, I don't know if there's even been planning to look at additional signals that it's not going to meet the VDOT spacing. So I don't know. Is there, I mean, it has been looked at. <laughs> yeah. So what is the team? I mean, so what's I mean, what's the preliminary idea? I mean, we're talking about widening. Right now, there's um, you know that. On Haycock, you only have the, uh, the one through lane and then the two turns. I mean, what has been looked at as far as improvement, you know, infrastructure improvements? Because a lot of people are going to walk here, but a lot of people are also going to drive. I mean, yeah. for city residents, this is actually the farthest end of the city. Um, there are a lot of county residents who are live much closer mm -hmm. um, who will walk. Um, and are probably be interesting to hear what the county folks have to say about it. But um, for city residents, I mean, I think, you know, fair enough people still drive. And so, I think it's key in addition, you know, to, I guess that's my question, so what's, what's been looked at so far? I haven't heard a lot about that part of it. Uh, and I want to make sure that, um, when, you know, when the public 
you know, comes in. I mean, you know, we all know that that's going to be, you know, on people's minds right. as far as how that works because it's already a difficult intersection today without this. So. And it has to coordinate with the grant we have as well. Right. Exactly. That yeah. fifteen point seven million grant. Yep. Right. So I haven't heard a lot about the specifics as far as what you know the team has been looking at. I mean, I see that in this this the, the drawing doesn't show that level of detail. So and maybe we're not there yet. We have, you know, but. Yeah, so, we, so what's, been hap what's happened so far is um, uh, Igor Slade's been working with the city, mm -hmm. kind of coordinating a traffic study for the whole area, including, I believe, the Virginia Tech and Wilmotta parcels, too. Mm -hmm. um, and so that there's kind of one traffic study that thinks about the whole area. And then we've hired Igor Slade as our traffic and engineering consultant also, because they're the most familiar with the details of the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll be coordinating with the city, going to meet with VDOT, coordinating with the city to meet with citizens about the traffic here, too. So we're just getting up to speed. What we do think is critical, um, you know, if, if the whole benefit, the only thing that's been proven to start solving traffic issues is to create as much grid of streets as you can, because mm -hmm. it gives people as many ways to get around as possible. And one of the issues we have, I mean, I live in DC, in Adams Morgan, which is a very high you know, urban area, and has a lot of grid of streets. So it's it's rare that we ever think about traffic where I live, right? Like that's not a topic of conversation because there's a million ways to go and there's always a road to go. And, and But as you get further in the suburbs and, and the streets get more closed off and cul-de-sacs and it's not as easy to flow of traffic, you get into more and more traffic issues. So part of what this project is about is kind of reintroducing the grid of streets through into a neighborhood. Um, and and where the, what that does is it means when traffic is really bad, there are other ways to go throughout, so you can kind of get through the neighborhood that we've created here. Um, right, but this, but this side, I think, is, is again, it's really only accessed by those two arterials, I and mean, you can't get here from the, anywhere else in the city without taking Haycock or Seven. Agreed, but what happens yeah. is, if this is a bottleneck, for example, which it is, right. mm -hmm. cars that are coming down here that are all waiting to make a turn here Oh yeah. Um, have the ability, sorry, Right now, you're mixing all of your right turn and left turn cars are coming down here to sit at that traffic light. Mm -hmm. And by creating a grid of streets, a portion of those cars now have the ability to go this way and make a right. And a portion of those cars are still going to go this way to make a left. And you start separating out those cars. You literally doubled the capacity of that system. Um, well, and especially if you have ability to come out of the metro, some, like right. in the future development. Right. That's gonna be because because right now, it's, it's pretty much It's boring. private, but I mean, the idea is that it will feel like a public street with public access easements. And so... All of those, all of those streets. It's similar to here when traffic is terrible on seven and people drive on park oh. um, to get around the neighborhood. Right, right. And so, yeah. creating that secondary network of streets starts helping that issue, sure, especially no, at better times. I, mean, I think. I mean, the grid, the layout, from an urban design perspective. Yeah. Uh, without a doubt, I think that the grid is the way to go. But um, again, I just think it, you know, as the, that gets fleshed out, maybe when the Grove like, releases their study, yeah, um, you know, there'll be more detail on that. I just think that's going to be key to, you know, making the whole thing work. Um, we, we're going to add a light too, aren't we? At yeah, there's a, there's a concept of, so right now within that MBTA grant, there's a traffic light proposed on 7, um, and there's a uh, what's called a hawk signal proposed right. here, which we would actually like to be a traffic signal. So we would want a full traffic light here, ideally. I'd Haycock. like to see a light on Haycock. The, the well, real problem with that, the doesn't the space yeah, yeah, but I think we need it out at the entrance. But the real problem with that traffic is it's mostly cut through. They're mm -hmm. cutting through from right. Great Falls down to um, 29. Exactly, yeah. And so I think more lights would be better because we want we want to make it a less convenient cut through. Mm -hmm. Well, you also want because to because and the lights safe. would only help me who has to go there every day picking up and drop off yeah. my girl for right. sports right. after. Right. I mean, right. I go there twice a day. I think that's not a cut through. Hey, Haycock's a minor material. I mean, it's not. People aren't cutting through. I mean, they got to through road that connects to Shreve. Well, so I mean, they're that's they're not, not stopping in the city. They're just driving through it. No, that wasn't part of the city until very recently. It's just that one block. But I but I, I think that mm -hmm. I don't. That's not cut through traffic. It's just it's a very busy area. That's all I'm trying to get mm -hmm. at. Great. Um, and so I think we need to. Continue. It's a commuter route. How about right. that? Yeah. Oh yeah. It's a through road. It's a major. You know, it's one of the ways to get. We'll get some help too from the flyover that's so. going to go to West Falls Church. Right. That'll yeah. relieve some, some right. of the traffic at that. One of the most dangerous yeah. places is making that left-hand turn into the school site. No, 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 off of Haycock. Oh, yeah. Oh, right, yeah. Up, 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 up. To, to the Virginia Tech site? Right there. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. because you, what happens is it backs up for the people that need to cross over to Shreve, right. and so you can't see that second right lane, and you have to guess sometimes right. and just oh. go for it. <coughs> right. And that's why that needs a light, because right now it, there's guessing going on all oh. the time. Right. And then if you're coming out of there, what you try to do is go around it and actually cut behind the giant. So, I mean, it's... Yeah, I mean, our preference is to have two lights. And, and yeah. so, for yeah. example, 
because that's so dangerous right there, particularly in the evenings uh, for activities. Yeah. Because I go up, up to a lot of games and ah, scary as the dickens. We are cognizant that there's a real desire to protect Chestnut Street across, yeah, and yeah. so I think that's I think that's doable. There's a way to make sure that the traffic is not going through that neighborhood um, and not to have that necessarily be through. But then also to have a but also to have a um, a traffic light getting into the project so you can get that traffic off of Haycock. Um, and then the last thing I'd say also on traffic that's true is right now you've got a metro that's very auto oriented so everybody's driving to it. And you're not gonna get everybody to start walking and biking to Metro, right? But you don't need to. If you were to get eight percent, ten percent of the users to start walking or biking or scootering or being, you know, instead of driving, you start really cutting into traffic flow. Um, and so part of that comes from creating a pretty walk. So today, for people that live here to walk to Metro is pretty unattractive. Um, it's pretty inhospitable and you're walking up against major roads. Um, and you're, you know, the high school is somewhat of a barrier today. Well, it's hard to cross. If you, if you create it's really a, hard to cross, if you create exactly. a way to cross that chestnut, that would help a lot. I mean, there's, there are people who live in Falls Hill, that neighborhood thing I was talking right. Falls Hill neighborhood that run across the street. <laughs> Uh, which is pretty dangerous, but folks do it because otherwise they got to walk down to the signal. Yep. And so if there's, I mean, yeah, I mean, if there's a way to create a crossing there, yeah. I and then not just the crossing, but imagine then walking on a really nice, attractive, right. retail-oriented oh, yeah. street all the way back to the metro. It's all, this is only a half mile all the way to seven, so you do, you know, it's a 15-minute walk, um, 10 minutes for some people. So it starts opening up the catchment area of the metro. And that gets some people out of their cars. And we're not going to solve every issue, but I think there are ways to start solving some of these issues. And Wyatt was saying yesterday about working it out with Fairfax County to try to get a better connection from the uh, bike path mm -hmm. back right. on up. Exactly. And then we still, in the great glorious future, as I was talking with you about the, uh, you know, getting a way to get up to the high school a lot better. And I, you know, should the federal realty ever get redeveloped. Paul told me that we could, we have access to the back of the giant. Oh, cool. For you know, bike lane. Which would be absolutely perfect. Um, could I just stick okay, to the I'm glad you started talking about the transit. I mean, this is our only chance to do something really transit oriented, right. mm -hmm. given where it is. And I mean, we talked a lot about traffic, we talked a lot about accommodation, and we, we know that everybody's not going to drive, we're not going to walk. But, what have you done other than opening that up? Mm -hmm. What's different about this from a tr from a non-auto perspective, mm -hmm. given how unique this is and, and how special it is by the subway station here? Yep. I yeah. mean, there's a little bit big parking garage, right? Which is which I think is anathema to a lot of the placemaking you're trying to right. achieve. Other than opening that up, how how else? This is not going to be just locally serving. Right. This, you, you, you're designed. You're trying to bring in folks all throughout the region. Yeah. How so does this? How does so, this so I'd say there's different audiences for different parts of the project. So, for the retail component of the project, we have to have parking for the retail to survive. There needs to be people that can get to the site easily, obviously, especially for restaurants and grocery. So there is parking for the retail certainly. Um, our parking counts for residential. We're at 0.8 per unit for the apartments, which is not a huge amount for an apartment building um, in a suburban area, and that kind of encourages people not to have cars to the extent they can. And is that less than our code? Paul, is that they're going to see reduction for parking, sorry, parking reduction? We're at 0.8 <coughs> per unit. I think it is because yeah. we had 0.9 at, uh, uh, what's the one we just approved? <laughs> yes, that Founders would be Founders, Founders, Founders Row, Row I think, uh, and they applied for a... So uh, ranges from one to two per unit, yeah. Yeah, so, depending on the bedroom configuration. And so part of that is having less parking, um, providing car share options. Um, so people can be encouraged not to have a car, and when they need to go grocery shopping, they can you know use a car, car share space. Um, we would also then um, we would measure that. So to the extent that we're effective in getting people out of their cars, we have the ability in future phases to do less parking. Um, and so you kind of create a, a system where people are encouraged not to use parking. You charge for it, which also encourages them not to not to have a car. Um, for the office space as well, the phase one office building is assumed to have a good amount of parking because it's we're creating the district. Whereas the phase two building, we think we'll have much less parking. So we're kind of setting it up for this future where it becomes much more pedestrian oriented, especially with car share too, because that gives people more, and, and Uber and things like that, it gives people the opportunity to really not own a car. We've been talking about, we've been doing some research on this idea of, you know, could you market this building as a low car oriented building where between 
car share and Uber and bikes and all the other things that we can provide with bike lanes in this great pedestrian environment, could you attract people who specifically want to live here because they don't want to have a car, but they work in Tyson's or something, or you know, they can get to Metro, work by Metro or um, by bus. So there's, there's ideas we're actually studying and doing research on around that. I'd love to be able to do something to that extent if we think it could work. Shared um, curb space, mm -hmm. things like this. Yeah, and, and then the design of it, um, you know, having retail-oriented, I mean, it goes back to, like, the best planning principles of Jane Jacobs, right? Like, having retail-oriented streets um, with light coming out of the retail that makes people feel safe when they come back from Metro at night is one of the best ways to encourage people to get out of their cars and actually take Metro. Um, and so, you know, Metro, rec WMATA, recognizes this as a great opportunity for them because they want to increase ridership here. And so if that grid of streets really works and that pedestrian boulevard feels great, you really will get people out of their cars. Um, providing the bike lanes, which we've incorporated into the project, helps as well, bike share. Um, so it, it's, it's going to be a mix of 10 or 15 strategies um, that will ultimately help uh, ensure that at least the new people living here won't use cars as often as the current people living in the neighborhoods. And, and I think that's, the, that's key as well. It's the, the new people. So just the fact of adding this density and proximity to Metro is... is you know, principle one really about the of the transit orientation. And then on the above grade structure deck, so we we've originally had a plan with more below grade parking. Um, the city was trying to come up with ways to increase land value, and so part of the reason we have that above grade parking deck is because it's a creative way to increase land value for the city because it's less expensive for us to provide parking. But it also creates an opportunity for the city. So we have no idea where car ownership is going, and we could find ourselves in 10, 15 years where like my kids will never own a car. Um, and we all know millennials are opting not to own cars as often. So to the extent auto driverless cars and car share become the future, you know, you won't need an 800 space structured parking deck, in which case that can be torn down and be a development site. Um, so it, and, you know, if that were below grade, as it is in Columbia Heights at the Target, that's a waste of space that will never, ever be captured again for anything other than mothball parking that never gets used. Um, there's hundreds of spaces down there that no one uses. Whereas this gives at least an opportunity for flexibility in the future. Mm -hmm. I'd encourage you to talk up those. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, I don't think I can explain it correctly, but there's a situation with the parking garage that they're uh, having to deal with Fairfax County mm -hmm. to have that used by the school and have that on the school property and everything like that. So. It, is still waiting for cooperation from Fairfax County yep. with it. And it's just one of those things that was uh, on the percentage of use of land up there. Um, on your main streets and everything, I can understand where you've got parking to have curbs, but are there going to be any curbs on the middle section? On the uh, I'm sorry, where are you, where are you thinking? Well, about? just there's, a, I know you've got parking and street parking. So there's probably oh, yeah, curbs, yeah, yeah. Yes. but are you going to have, we have one development with a festival uh, street uh -huh. where there's no curbs in front of Mad Where it's Box. curbless. Uh-huh. Yeah. I was just wondering if you're going to include that. Yeah, do you section. want to talk about that from the retail section? There's an idea oh, for some, uh, okay. that retail yeah, okay. plan. There we go. So if we see it on the, the bottom plan, mm -hmm. so you can see the parked cars on the retail side. So you've right, got right. some of that, that teaser parking. It also buffers the pedestrians um, from, from the moving vehicles. And then on the the, the boulevard side, tor side towards the green in the middle, that likely would be curbless or at okay. least curbless in portions of right, it. And right. this gets to the ease of crossing, but also some of the emergency access. Can the fire truck right. get out there? Or the guys be able and to it also yeah there? also helps if you shut the whole street down. Right, right. To right. have more of a flow, it's really worked in a very small area here. Uh, uh, out of curiosity, have you done any of this uh, deep soil tests up at that site? You know the answer to that. Uh, <laughs> December twenty sixth. Oh, okay. Twenty eighth. <laughs> right, so we couldn't. The only way. Only reason is that the the school site is all infill. It so was they, a mess. Yeah, so we got the original uh, soils reports um, uh, around the school, and we're doing additional borings, and we're doing them uh, between Christmas and New Year's while school is out. But I think you'll probably find more of the farmland up above because that was all s silt running down into the 
uh, into that stream way down there. Yeah, it appears that on the back side of the high school, between uh, where the high school is and the uh, intermediate school is, is where the largest amounts of fill are. That's yeah, that all came from Seven Quarters Shopping Center. Yeah. Yeah. 18 feet of it. Yeah. But, uh, the, uh, but, you know, when we redid the uh, stadium field, we had a it was about a half million extra because they had to take it. It was all landfill. Right. Oh, really? And so they had to take that all out. Now, you know what my question is. Yes, I'm ready for it. I'm ready for the answers. Um, <laughs> I keep asking, and I will continue to do so, uh, is the parking garage going to be built strong enough to be able to put anything on top of it? So this is the third time I've been asked this question. This is the first time I and have a partial it. answer. You'll hear it. Um, okay, so the above-grade garage that's designed here is a Pre-cap, there's two different types of above grade parking. You have poured in place concrete where you pour mm -hmm. slabs and you have precast where you bring in pieces, which is less expensive. So the garage is designed as precast today. Um, if it were to be poured in place, it would be eight to $10 million more expensive. So, and poured in place gives you more structure and ability to build above, uh, which my guess is probably not worth it to the city. It would reduce land value pretty dramatically. We're looking at whether you could do something above a precast garage and what that would entail. Um, and what that might cost. So I'll have that answer for you. It'll take a little bit of time. Um, the only thing we'd have to be aware of is to the extent there's a desire to do something above precast in the future, you kind of need to know up front what you want to do. Right. Because the structure needs to be created in a way that it supports it. Um, and so, for example, at Pike and Rose, we have solar carports on the entire top level, oh, excuse me, of that uh, precast garage, but we knew that in advance. So we dealt with all the pre-wiring for it, and we uh, made sure that the structure could handle the weight, especially the weight of the snow on top of the solar um, carports. So you, there needs to be some pre-work involved in that. Um, and so the, then the question becomes, we will find out what that cost might be to the extent, right now the city gets roughly $5 million more for us doing precast parking above grade, to the extent that amenity costs or that extra structure costs three, four million dollars, then that's less money the city would get. So mm -hmm. I think there would just be have to be a conversation about trade offs on that. You take it down anyway, at some point, so right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it might that's what somebody at one of our right. guys we talked to had said it might just be cheaper at that point to take to it take down it down and just, just you know, build an amenity on the first floor and build what you need. Yeah. And for everything you're working very closely with people building the high school too. Yeah. Yeah, we have regular meetings. Um, we have a monthly meeting, and then we about every other week we have a meeting with them as well. Any other questions? Yeah. Including, yeah, so we'll meet with them tomorrow. Yeah, I guess one question, just, and I don't think you covered it, or at least I didn't hear it. So what's your conception in terms of, like, the environmental side of this project mm -hmm. and, and LEED and all those different certifications? I mean, are, what are you guys going to, what's your overall goal going to be there? Yeah, so our agreement, it has LEED gold for all the buildings with the exception of the hotel, which is LEED silver. Um, the lead ND gold as well, neighborhood development. Um, and the, I think what will be really high, I mean, and you can talk to this too, I should actually, I'll, we'll go back and forth because Murphy has more experience on this than I do. But um, really high level of storm storm water management perspective, um, we're looking into from a heat island perspective what we'll be doing with lighter color materials, with green roofs, with large street trees. Um, so, you know, I have experience with solar, Pian Hoffman has experience with solar as well. Um, in our case, the solar was able to l l light the entire garage at Pike and Rose as well as part of the hotel. So, um, so we're looking into that. We're meeting with uh, account, uh, Commissioner Stevens also about the um, um, property pace. assessed clean energy. Thank you, property yeah. assessed yeah. clean yeah. energy. Yeah. And so we know the city might be interested in doing something to that extent. So we're going to learn as much as we can as we can about it. Um, and so our goal is to be, our goal is to think about this project. I mean. It will be a high level of sustainability, and then the question is whether we're going to be marketing it also as a high level of sustainability. Right. Um, and in some communities, that's extremely important to people. In some communities, it's less so. Um, it's almost expected at this point. Really, well, that's what really I was going to say. I mean, here. if you were going to market it that way, you really should be going for platinum. Yeah, because, I mean, so because anything I see marketed as environmentally, you know, for our energy free, it's all you know, it's usually right. platinum. Yeah, so I, I'd say this. I mean, we're we're less so as a company. EYA is less focused on USGBC and what their different requirements are for different buildings, because there's a million ways to be really sustainable that may not meet the way they're thinking about it. Um, and so so we have our own thoughts on HVAC and how to be really sustainable from an HVAC perspective that might not 100% marry up to them. So platinum is is a great goal for some places. For this site, that might not be the best 
goal, so we got to figure out what's the right thing for this site. Um, and a lot of it, we think in this case, is about stormwater management, and it's about um, it's about heat island. It's about creating the right place with the right landscaping that's going to be, you know, um, attractive as well. Um, but we'll we'll be working with all of you on that over the next. That was a big question months. yesterday with a lot of discussion. Do you, uh, it's way too yeah. far in advance, but kind of just touching uh, on that a little bit. Do you have e EUI targets or any energy use intensity targets for the buildings themselves? Uh, we haven't yet. We haven't gotten that far along, but we we will later. Okay, yeah. Okay. Well, and then, you know, with interest, we had a presentation. What was that? Like a few weeks ago about yeah. the fact that in the long term, it, it it's the material costs. The it's what yeah. the material does environmentally right. that's more important. So, have you guys? I mean, you're looking at that side of it as well. Yeah, using sustainable materials. Yeah. Right, because it's if they said as time goes on, that's really the bigger piece of the pie is what was done, how it was constructed, and the materials used. Right. That was the Chris Pike uh, presentation from November 5th. Oh, good call. Recall. <laughs> I just knew it was a while ago. <laughs> it's the kinds of materials, but it's also, I think you pointed this out, how they come together. Mm -hmm. So a tight building envelope so right. that reduces energy usage and leakage and, and um, even the upfront costs of systems is a big, big part of it. I think the really exciting part of the sustainability strategy is it's both. It's both uh, a neighborhood development lead strategy, so looking at it from the community standpoint, and then a collection of lots of different buildings, lots of different kinds of buildings that, uh, that have their own lead component as well. So it's inside the building, it's outside the building for, for the neighborhood, and I think energy is going to be the, the key piece um, yeah, to, to focus on on the individual buildings. The hardest part is going to be... Um, it, once, there's always a balance in everything, right? So we're building wood frame buildings here, which by the nature of them are harder to achieve certain USGBC goals from a lead perspective. Um, they do have their own elements that are very sustainable, but for example, building envelope in a wood frame building is harder to achieve than concrete because the building shifts more. It's harder to have, you know, on the top of a wood frame building, uh, a more efficient HVAC system versus what you see typically in wood frame buildings, which are split systems. So there's, you know, the if... If in order to achieve sustainability goals, the building needs to go to concrete, then that means the building is more expensive to build, which means the land value is less. So mm -hmm. we're trying to balance that, which is why we came up with this proposal of wood frame, less expensive, we can pay more for land. So that's that's where we're at. But I, I, you know, we're, these buildings will be sustainable, and we'll, you guys will be proud of it ultimately when it's done. You're going to do uh, stick built even on some of the higher density buildings? Just the Right now, just the multifamily apartment building is stick built, and then potentially one of the one or two of the condo buildings might be okay. but the others are going to be concrete, concrete. Oh. yeah all right um i had a few questions some are probably obvious and that other people know because they've been to all the meetings i haven't been to any um the phasing mm -hmm. what what's the main reason not to do it all at once just yeah just absorption so just the ability the office markets so in this case, condos and office are two things you don't want to come out with too many at once okay because condos you know you're even in a great market you're only going to sell a few months so you could build that whole building and sit for five five years before it sells out. So you want to phase that in little chunks, um, and your lenders are going to kind of force yeah. you to phase and it. Yeah, and so I guess that sort of probably leads it to my next question, which is the timing of phase two would sort of depend on how quickly the other stuff is taken yeah, out. That's so exactly if it's going right. fast, you'd build it sooner, and if it's slower. And yeah. then the <clears throat> office flex, what is the flex mm. possibilities? Uh, so that's that's from this is from our original submission a while ago. So and at the time, that was office flex, meaning it could be residential or office. Mm -hmm. In our new plan, what we've done is broken that up into two parcels. So there's now an office and a residential parcel okay. for the second phase. Okay, so that's probably what it'll end up being. Yeah. And for the office that's going to go to phase one, what's the height on that? And is that flexible? Like if you're sensing a lot of demand when you're working on it, you can yeah, build it higher? Here. So this building is roughly 125,000 square feet, and it's 20,000 per floor, so it's six to seven stories above the retail. So it'll feel like an eight, eight to 10 story building. Mm -hmm. And we could go taller than that. Um, that will depend on pre-leasing. So when we so come before you for the SEE, we'll get kind of a range of square footage approved for that building. And then to the extent we get some you know, really big- Corporate pre says, right. hey, I'll take the we whole building. Certainly love to do bigger, obviously. All right. And then, um, you probably don't have any idea about this, but the timing of either the Virginia Tech or the WMATA stuff, I mean, is that on the same time scale of, of, of this project, or is that sort of like... 
it's it's not as quick as this project. I mean, this project we're hoping to break ground, you know, within two a little over two years. Right. Um, so I don't think they're quite there. They've been coordinating really closely though with the city um, from a planning perspective. So I think there's a lot of conversations about timing back and forth between them. Yeah. Virginia Tech. The, uh, what I'd say about Virginia Tech is we know that we're one of the two teams they've kind of are starting to negotiate with. Uh, we don't know what their timing is as far as making a selection. Our hope is it sometime in the next six months or so. Yeah, and also then, hoping their Amazon plans don't. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Areas, so. um, and then <laughs> WMATA, I am not 100% sure what WMATA's plans are, but I know they're focused on it. They're, okay. they Because, I mean, the, the, the street <laughs> and the, the story <laughs> tells really cool getting up to right. Metro, but doesn't isn't, isn't as cool if, if you get to a fence right, right there. And, yeah, no, I mean, WMATA's been, so. WMATA's been at the table talking to the city, very focused. They understand the benefit of having a street grid that works there. Cool. They submitted a comprehensive plan right. amendment to Fairfax County along with, so they know, they are focused on this. My sense is they'll come out with an RFP or at some point. That takes a long time, Fairfax. Yeah. And, um, mm -hmm. and then the parking deck, you mentioned 800 spaces. First of all, if you had your druthers, you would want it, you wouldn't want it, you would want it. Because yeah. I know the schools are kind of trying to decide. Mm -hmm. um, it's how much of it would be for the commercial side versus the school side? So there'd roughly. be roughly 187 spaces for the school mm -hmm. um, on the first floor. And then they would have, the idea is that on overflow days where you guys have you know, a really big school event, um, some of the flex parking in there, the office parking, which is generally not gonna be the same hours, can be used for overflow from the school. Okay. Um, that same parking would be used for overflow from the restaurants and the music venue as well. So that's one of the nice things about the office is that those so it's mostly to serve the office, which obviously it's office and retail largely. Yeah, has limited use in the evening and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then um, my favorite topic, which is especially until you have that connectivity to Metro, you should look into the autonomous mini buses that okay. can essentially make that a virtual connection. So it would run up and down one. your <laughs> or Ollie or May Mobility up in Michigan. They they are already actually doing it in places. What's the name? May Mobility. Um, just because it costs, <laughs> I actually do. It's less than you think, but um, well, how much is it? They told me you can get a fleet of like six of them for less than a less than a like seven hundred grand a year, which seems like a lot, but for a magic bus system, and, and that was for when I was talking about like serving the whole city for something like this, it could be a lot less. But, but I'm just thinking that until that connectivity is there, if you just had a little bus that literally every five minutes zipped you over to the metro and back, um, it could be both cool and an effective way to make that connection. But overall, I think it's great, and um, um, hopefully everything is smooth sailing from here on out. Right. <laughs> I'm sure it will be. <laughs> Let me just uh, play off of that. Um, what do you see as uh, some of the risks here going forward? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, that's a good question. The biggest risk is, um, I would say, because we have so many different uses in our first phase, you know, one of the risks would be the market for X you know, goes away or the economy crashes. I mean, I'd say the economy crashing is probably the big, biggest risk <laughs> for all of us in this region. Um, and we're not, you know, the nice thing here is typically metro-oriented sites have been more protected during crashes than other places because people still are craving urban walkable neighborhoods near metro. So that demand has been relatively high. Uh, but a crash of the market would be a, a risk. Um, you know, even in these product types, even though it's a mix of uses, I don't know that there's... Um, I don't know that one is necessarily more risky than the others. Condos and office tend to be more risky than multifamily apartments, which if you build it and the market's not there, eventually the market will come back. Condos, you got to build them and sell them once. So that's a, a pretty big risk there. Uh, Bill, if I just real quick, so the, we've had trouble attracting a hotel uh -huh. property here. Why would the site be different for? I, okay. So it's a good question. We've talked to a few hoteliers already um, that are interested, and part of it is the sponsors. So, you know, yeah, Hoffman has an unbelievable experience and track record. People love the wharf. Their hotel, hotels have been extremely successful there. Um, at Pike and Rose, which we built um, when I was at Federal Realty, the Canopy Hotel has been is wonderful. It's really cool right in the middle of the project. So there are hotel companies that understand the benefits of creating an urban walkable transit-oriented space and that that is a different, it is different economics than other hotels that might have been in the city before. So I think that's why there's more interest. Um, it doesn't guarantee that, you know, we think that hotel deal is going to work really well, but that's still a risk too. You're right; hotels risky in general. Uh, Just have one thought. You got your uh, No. But who uh, out of I guess 
the two of you, who is uh, responsible for the architecture? Well, okay. it's a team. <laughs> okay, it's a team. But I, yeah, but it, so it's going to be cooperative or different architects working on different parts. This is a good question. So, so we are. I'm the developer, or okay. one of the developers. Right. Came up in um, right. EYA and Regency. Tordy Gallus is our consultant, um, working for us on the architecture and planning side. So they are going to be doing the overall planning. There'll be architects for a good portion of these buildings. There may be a different architect here and there for a building or two. Okay. Um, and then to the extent they're, you know, on the multiple buildings they're on, we'll make sure that the architecture feels and looks different um, so it doesn't feel like you're, you know, in Disneyland. Absolutely. Thank you. Although I do love, uh, thank you, I love Disneyland. <laughs> I love Disneyland. One of my favorite places, I agree. <laughs> I'd just like to hear you talk in general about what drew you to this site and to the city in general. Uh -huh. uh, so I've been thinking about this site for five years. When I was at uh, Federal Realty, which owns the shopping center next door, we had always kind of thought about what, you know, or followed what was going on and thought about potentially something going on here. And I participated in a ULI tap that the city oh, right, performed. Right, yeah. So I was one of the kind of business um, people. It was kind of funny. Okay. There was only like three of us at a table off by ourselves. And if you remember, the room was really long and skinny. We were the last table in the other room. So we, <laughs> we couldn't even see the presentation. Um, but, <laughs> but anyway, but you know, the building blocks were there. Um, and projects that I personally like to work on and that EYA likes to work on are things where we can create a neighborhood and create a place. <clears throat> and here, you have enough land area um, you have these hidden assets like the metro, um, where you can you can really create something different here that would transform the space. And so people thinking of it initially um, may never assume that you could create something like this here. But those of us who have done it before know that it's possible. Um, there aren't a lot of you know big pieces of land near metro um, left that are in really great neighborhoods and a great city where you have a dedicated population and people that are really engaged and really good schools and. Um, you know, good job market, and you're close to other good job markets, so it has all of these great characteristics to it. Um, and the opportunity, quite frankly, to have it be three big parcels collectively working jointly makes it even that much more exciting. Um, so, I mean, that, that's why we were originally excited, and I would say since working engaging with the city, what's been very clear is how excited and interested and engaged the people are in the process, and how good it's been to work with the city to date. So a lot of entitlements in this region will be um, somewhat difficult or you know, you're kind of battling it out with the jurisdiction. Um, and what's great is you guys have done all the pre-work you needed to do over the last four or five years to set this up in the right way so that it can be successful and that we can have a process working with the community where this will be something that the community is excited about. Um, and that doesn't mean that everybody's going to be excited. I'm sure there'll be some that won't. But I think um, oftentimes that lift is all on the developer. Right. where you're trying to kind of convince everybody to do something and the city's not even sure they really want it. And it's, it's been a really nice partnership to date working with everybody. Terrific. I think, it's, I think it's ironic that the city, when the metro came in, went out of their way to have the metro stations located outside the city. And so we are finally building around one of them. <laughs> Time. I, you know, it's somewhat of a case study. I mean, when this goes through and ultimately gets built, um, I think jurisdictions that have the foresight you guys have had, and obviously you were in a situation where you kind of needed to do it because you had to build a school. <laughs> so there was something that forced this to happen. But even if that weren't there, as you think about future parts of the city, like when a jurisdiction does the pre-work in advance to set something up to be successful, it makes a huge difference because you're, you're allowing the developer to come in and work with the city collectively and not have it be um, con controversial um, and confrontational, which is what often happens. And when it's yeah. confrontational, it means there's more risk. It means you don't know if you're going to get approvals. It means you don't know if you're going to be able to get through the process and get permits. Um, when you know your city manager can assemble 30, 40 city employees to discuss a project in one big meeting, that's you never get that in any jurisdiction. So it's really a very cool process. Don't get too comfortable. <laughs> We'll get through this, but there will be some public meetings that could last till midnight or That's longer. Fine. That's fine. I'm used to that. <laughs> we get a lot of comments sometimes. Because mm -hmm. they're their neighbors to the site. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there really weren't that many comments yesterday. It was amazing. Well, okay. and certain questions, but 
People wait till they're sudden, There's some all people of a sudden, who. Uh, Wyatt saying, doesn't anybody have anything to say? <laughs> I, think, right. I think a lot of people who go to those public meetings are just, they're, they're interested in the project and they're positive. Yeah. Right, Usually right. it's, it's the when final we're public actually meeting going where to vote. They never heard of this before. That's when the people show up. So I'm just saying, don't get too comfortable, but it'll be fun. Okay. We've gotten First through it multiple this. times. Karen's, Karen's <laughs> been through some of those. Yeah, she knows. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Uh, well, I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, as someone who has been on really virtually every committee associated with this um, over the last couple of years, I know there's a real commitment from the city mm -hmm. to make this work. We do have some some impetus for needing to have this happen. But um, even outside of that, there, there's just been real cooperation from, uh, certainly I can speak for the Planning Commission, but also from the school board and, right. and from the city council and, and all the surrounding members. I, I do. I do think it's uh, fair to say that we are excited as a, a group. There's details to work out. Um, I do have lots and lots of questions, but I I do know that they've already been raised in these other forums, and I, I don't think it's worth you know going through all the question marks about the garage and the, right. and, and how things are going to flow with the high school and all those sort of considerations. Uh, those will be answered in due time. And uh, but I will say uh, again, as part of those committees, I do think the proposal you put together here and it continues to adjust um, has been really thoughtful. And uh, uh, it was uh, just a sort of a, a breath of fresh air as we received it. Or as, again, let me just speak for myself. To, to think that you incorporated uh, many of the elements we were looking for, um, were really responsive to, to the RFP, uh, thought, uh, I thought really cr uh, critically and, and importantly about how it works with the school, which was really important. Um, uh, I was also really drawn to the, the large phase one component of this. Right. I think that, um, that uh, I know you understand that that's important, but, um, I think uh, it's a fact that many in the city don't appreciate what the, what kind of investment this requires from a developer to 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 do you know three hundred and some odd million dollars of investment right up front um, on a market that's partially unproven in that area and 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 you know you're putting in some Class A office space that uh, I think our city uh, demands but uh, but also desperately needs so to 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 put. Um, you know, your money where your mouth is and do that huge phase one was a real big appeal to me in addition to your experience in the placemaking. So um, uh, it's exciting now to that this is, again, out in the open and we can now talk about it and, and it's not all, you know, bottled up in notebooks and under confidentiality and things like that. So uh, I'm really excited about it. I've been on record as saying that many times. Uh, so uh, welcome to the city and, and, and I look forward to working with you and the Planning Commission to uh, make this, you know, as best a project as we possibly can. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. So where are you tomorrow night? I mean, it's, I assume it's one. Is a school board, and then and then Wednesday. I mean, it's it's every night. Wednesday night we have off. You have off. I'm gonna see my wife and kids Wednesday. Really nice. <laughs> I got an invite uh, yesterday at like 11 o'clock to come to the Sunday town hall. Uh, and I was like, you, Rush, you should really show up at this. I'm like, I, I think I'm gonna hear it on 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 Monday night. It's I've already heard it, and he's like, it the after the fifth time, I'll be able to give it. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're getting pretty good at it. Okay, well, thank you all. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, it's actually on the hard drive here. It's on this. I have no way to connect. Because yeah. we're on the school system over here versus the city system. Okay, you want me to email to you? Yeah. Um, Carly has it too. Oh, yes, she is? Yeah. Okay, I'll just get it from her. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to. Yeah, I couldn't find out. <laughs> I don't know how to use a map. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Yeah, night. you too. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, all right. Um, let's go back to. Uh, Action item uh, number six, which was now seven, uh, on the uh, 2019 meeting dates. Uh, 
which I'm not sure there's much to talk about. Are you want to uh, just uh, make sure that we looked at them? Uh, I guess the January one's the big change. Yes. Uh, so this is. Uh, thank you. So uh, before you tonight uh, is your uh, tentative. Uh, meeting uh, schedule for calendar year 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, as usual, the calendar is based on the idea of meeting on the first and third Mondays of the month, except when there's a holiday and then that meeting date shifts to a Tuesday. Uh, certainly in 2018, this was the intent and there were a couple of meetings that got canceled due to uh, summer travel and, and awkward start dates with the start of school, and so there's always flexibility in this. The one place where this varies from that first and third style uh, is in January. So the first January, I'm sorry, the first Monday in January is January 7th. Uh, and with that uh, premise of getting package materials to you all a week in advance, that January 7th date becomes a real problem. Uh, and, and even getting them a week in advance on January 14 will be a stretch. But the idea is if we move that uh, mainly organizational meeting back to the 14th, that would give the commission a little more time to see materials. Uh, also, if um, uh, commissioners want to uh, make changes uh, uh, and weigh in on the rules of procedure, the annual report to council. It gives a little bit more time for the commissioners also to provide comment. Mm -hmm. The uh, intent would then be to do back-to-back -back meetings on the 14th and the 22nd. Uh, so uh, it would be the Monday and then the Tuesday following. I think there's a holiday in there. Uh, the 22nd would be designed as a business meeting. Uh, and so the package would come out probably shortly after the 14th, but there'd be little interaction between those two sets of materials. I guess the question is, um, the question is, could, is there any way to combine those meetings? I mean, how much reorganization do we need? Do we need a whole meeting for organization? And do we have enough business? Can we combine those into one meeting? The, uh, there's a, there are potential applications that are coming in, and we're working with the applicants to try and get their materials in. It's always a little right. difficult over the holiday break, and so I want to hold that January 22nd date in case there are applicants uh, who are on a time crunch to get the materials through. I don't want to... Uh, but, but isn't the reorganization just like we vote the chairman and the vice chairman and what else do we need? Uh, do we need a whole meeting we can have that? other stuff on there. Yeah, I think this year I want to, um, I hope that we uh, spend a little bit more time on it. I mean, by and large, we have some appointments we got to make and some chair and vice chair meetings. But uh, it was in this packet and, and there was a lot of comments as we went through the rules and procedures that I think right. require some discussion. Okay. Um, but... Uh, you know, whoever is the, the chairperson, they can cancel the 22nd if uh, they don't think it's necessary if these applications don't come in. Well, that's the other thing. If there are no applications, then, then the 22nd would really be designed as a uh, as needed. Okay. Uh, and I think this year we have already talked about um, trying to streamline the CIP process by saying these are the people we want to talk to. But I, I would note that normally, it's not on here we usually have a there's there's a period where it goes three meetings in a row or two scheduled and then like a, another cip work session in that february march time frame usually february so uh, that's not an official meeting but i that time of year so so it is tight up front where it's going to go you know the 14th the 22nd and then the fourth and then i suspect the probably the following week after that just because that seems to be the way this works but maybe we can cut that out if we can give more guidance to Cindy on the CIP. On the, just for information, on the back of the hard copy of the agenda that was at the dais tonight, you can see a tentative agenda for that January 14 meeting. Um, uh, Krasner, as you said, it's, it's election of chair and vice chair. Uh, also looking at those survey results in terms of how does the planning commission want to run the meetings, what do you all need in terms of support from staff. Looking at the rules of procedure, the annual report, which could uh, and probably should identify a list of priorities or goals for the commission to address or request the council, uh, and then those CIP uh, priority questions. I think the idea here is to try and streamline the CIP process uh, uh, with as much business as is uh, going to be scheduled for the planning commission instead of sticking with the standard of multiple presentations on multiple topics across multiple nights. If the, planning if the temperature of the Planning Commission is that, in general, the CIP is good, uh, understanding there were updates from last year to this year, uh, but there are a handful of items that the Commission wants to explore in general, that could be a way to both streamline Commission's agendas as well as uh, staff preparation. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it is, again, something that maybe as we talk about on January, not uh, this evening, but 
we typically have had our uh, retreat, or what we've recently been calling our advance, in uh, in March. The, the day that looks like it falls in that range is the eight. The eighteenth would be a good date. I would say, however, that we're according to this presentation that we just heard, there is going to be a request for a recommendation on April first. So, um, if we don't really, I don't know what that means in terms of holding work sessions. It could always be pushed later into the year, uh, but typically we're trying to do it up front and do this dance between the CIP and uh, and uh, fitting this in in the, early, in the early part of the year. So, just something to think about. Uh, maybe we can uh, have a official designation of a date in January when we meet, just so we can give guidance to applicants that says we are not taking. Uh, things on the agenda, like give them heads up. If you want to get in and, and have us review something, it needs to not be for the, you know, don't plan on the 18th, um, something like that. I'd like to be able to give the, the community or the development community some guidance on that as soon as we can. So just to think about all this stuff that's happening in the beginning of the year. Okay. For what it's worth, April 15th is spring break, so some of us may not be here that day. That's a good, good point. Um, all right. Uh, otherwise, anybody have any questions? Does anybody have a real issue with the 14th? I think it's almost a necessity based on our new policy of trying to get these packaged out um, uh, at least a week in advance. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh. Great. Uh, all right. Let's move on to the fellow's <laughs> property acquisition. We need a motion to adopt that? No. We don't need to adopt the schedule. I think uh, it would be nice just to have an action to go with it. Okay. okay. So this is an action item. Well, it I'm is listed as an action item. You are correct, Mr. Krasner. Thank you. I um, move that we approve the proposed schedule. Can I get a second? Second. Do you think we need a roll call vote on this, or you think? Uh, do it all voice vote. Right. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Voice vote. And then if there's dissension, then yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll call for a roll call. Okay. okay. Fair enough. Roberts, all please. those in favor, please aye, say aye. 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 Any dissension? Okay. No. All right. This has been approved. Thank you for correcting me. Um, the, all right. Are we? <laughs> well, I, I think we're, we're. I think our rules of procedure say we have to adopt a schedule or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, item six B or seven B now. Uh, the fellows' property acquisition. Uh, before you, planning commissioners, tonight uh, is uh, an action item. This is uh, an approval of a proposed action by council to acquire. Uh, what was formerly known as the Fellows Property, uh, and you can see the lengthy legal description there in the title. It's the uh, Oak Park Subdivision, uh, Section 3, Lots 1 through 7. Uh, it's the property is located at uh, 604 South Oak Street, or was formerly located at 604 South Oak Street. It's across from the uh, TJ Elementary School, uh, fronting onto Oak Street, as well as uh, Parker and Fellows Court. I want to walk through a couple of the procedural items. I know this was a late <coughs> addition to the agenda. Uh, the, as I said, the request is for a, uh, an approval from the Planning Commission. Staff recommends uh, that Planning Commission do approve the acquisition uh, based on the guidance that it's consistent with the city's future land use map uh, and that the uh, city and the property owner have come to agreeable terms for uh, sale purchase of the land. Uh, for uh, background, uh, the size of the area, the size of the land, uh, just under two acres at uh, approximately 1.95 acres of land. Uh, in 2016, the city did amend its future land use map to show uh, that the uh, property would be best used for the community as, as either parks, open space, or schools. Uh, and as required, that did include a recommendation from the Planning Commission, which was positive. Uh, in 2018, um, the city had filed, uh, I'm sorry, or, uh, shortly after a subdivision uh, that was approved by the Planning Commission to convert it from one lot to seven, the city entered into a condemnation suit uh, to acquire the property uh, through a court process. Uh, however, there was now a, 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 an agreeable set of terms identified. The Planning Commission, by charter on any property acquisition, has to weigh in and uh, provide uh, approval of the acquisition. Uh, failing approval from the Planning Commission, uh, property can only be acquired by a supermajority of council, uh, supermajority vote of council. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, 
charter text that goes along with that is copied in lines 56 through 65 of the staff report. The staff report goes on to describe um, a description of the property as well as adjacent uses and what's shown on the future land use map and the zoning map. Uh, as I said, uh, staff, uh, planning staff recommends uh, positive approval of the acquisition. Uh, along with the positive approval, there's one other clause uh, in the proposed motion, uh, and that is that as the property is developed for public purposes, uh, that uh, serious consideration be given to the, the sidewalk crosswalk uh, network that was developed uh, as part of the subdivision process. Uh, that sidewalk network was motivated by uh, not only the city's sidewalk policies in the subdivision ordinance, uh, but also by the city's adopted Safe Routes to School plan, which identifies Parker as part of the TJ Trail. Uh, and so getting more crosswalks, more sidewalks, uh, as well as better curb geometry, including uh, curb extensions, was seen as a, a positive step for the community. Thank you, uh, not only for the staff report, but for putting it together so quickly. Uh, I hope everybody has had a chance to review it. I know this one was on a uh, non-traditional timeline for us. Uh, so I appreciate everybody agreeing uh, in part to uh, reviewing this on short notice. Uh, before uh, I turn this over to everybody in case about questions, um, let me do two things. First is a comment that I'm really excited that this is uh, coming before us. I know uh, myself and uh, many of the commissioners had... Is that Santa? It is Santa. <clears throat> he came by my street. Um, <laughs> all year. But that uh, I, I personally uh, was sort of saddened that we had to approve the subdivision when it came before us. Uh, I didn't think it. I didn't think it made a lot of sense back then. Um, I know we said as much. I felt like our hands were tied a bit at that time, and. Uh, uh, I think we, as a planning commission, we made a nice big show of how we were reluctant to vote for this so that it's sort of come full circle and um, they've come to some sort of agreement on price that we can now use it uh, for parkland or for schools really excites, excites me. Uh, before Again, so before I turn it over, let me first offer it to the public for public comment. Um, <laughs> seeing none, I'm going to close it to public comment and uh, now let me... Uh, open up to you guys for our comments or questions about the development. I have a quick question for Paul, maybe. Mm -hmm. Should the city be successful in acquiring the land? Is there ever a concept of unsubdividing? Would there ever be a reason to do that? Uh, that is uh, something that's included in the future steps in the staff report uh, that uh, look through the site planning code. I think there is guidance that when a site plan is submitted for multiple parcels, uh, there is an expectation that a, a subdivision would be carried out to uh, erase the interior lot lines. Anything else? I have yeah. a question. Um, so I recall in the CIP, the um, purchase of, of this land is included. There's, a, I guess, a placeholder for that. How about all of the improvements, the sidewalks, you know, just some kind of a swag at really making that into a park if that's the near-term goal on this. Has there been any attempt to estimate what those costs would be? Uh, I don't think there's been an estimate on the uh, public improvement sides of things, whether it's the, the frontages or the, the interior uses. And part of that is because the use is still flexible uh, in terms of what would be the ultimate design. There was a conceptual design for a park that was included as part of the condemnation suit and included uh, standard suite of amenities, uh, uh, pavilion, walking pads, uh, uh, preserved uh, woodland area, uh, playground equipment. And so I think that could be one of those items to look at as part of the, city, uh, the Planning Commission's review of the CIP. But all that would have to be funded. And right. Well, and I think a master park plan had, would have to be developed too, mm -hmm. to do any of the stuff inside. Right. 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 And the biggest we don't just problem do is uh, all the care for the, all the trees because some of them it's are just not one specimen tree. Not specimen? Yeah. One specimen tree according to the staff report. Yeah. One specimen, but there's so many that are not in good condition. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's really kind of a mess. There's also a house that would have to be well, right. yeah, a hundred right. year old house. Um, yeah, I guess just but it's, so be 
I, I estimate this has been like 14, 15 years to get here. We almost got it a long time ago. Yeah, no, it's very exciting. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's just. I think it makes sense. I just. It just makes sense. It's proximity um, to the school, just the need for open space. Uh, there's, a, I don't see a downside to this. I'm really pleased no. that the council's no. taken this action, even though I'm sure it was not inexpensive. Uh, and I think uh, these improvements around the outside for the, the the sidewalks and the crosswalks is really important. So I don't know if that's, uh, again, uh, as Mr. Stevens said, contemplating that price or if it's that's something that we have to deal with the CIP, and if it is, I think it's really important that that street is not easily walkable at all on the Parker, I think it is. So. Yeah, it is, and it's got an embankment and no sidewalk. Yeah, no, it's not, <laughs> and cars on it all the time or during right. school hours. Yeah. Uh, all right, uh, if anyone else wants to make a comment, uh, go ahead, but otherwise, I think we're ready for a motion. Yeah, this is a good thing. I'm going to read it all because... Tell us a story. I figured you would make me, so I, might as well, I got ready for it. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I let me bring say, a copy, though, just in case. I, since Paul came, we have these lovely warehouses now, and it's are so enjoyable to read. <laughs> well, I think it is important to communicate why the Planning Commission is taking this action. I okay. think can provide guidance, uh, certainly during development of the project. Okay, so... Whereas the City Council intends to purchase Fellows Property Oak Park Subdivision, Section 3, for the purposes of parks, open space, or schools, and whereas by Chapter 17.07 of the City Charter, the Planning Commission is required to approve or disapprove the acquisition of land, and whereas the City's adopted comprehensive plan, future land use map shows, the subject property being used for the intended uses, now, therefore, I move that the Planning Commission approve the acquisition of the Fellows Property, Oak Park Subdivision, Section 3, Lots 1 through 7, at the addresses of 310 Fellows Carp Court, RPC number 52-206-090, 306 Parker Avenue, RPC number 52-206-091, 304 Parker Avenue, RPC number 52-206-092, 302 Parker Avenue, RPC number 52-206-093, 502 South Oak Street, RPC number 52-206-094, 302 Fellows Court, RPC number 52-206-095, and 304 Fellows Court, RPC number 52-206-096, for the purposes of parks, open space, or schools. I further move that the Planning Commission and Council review the public improvements shown in the ultimate development plan prepared as part of the recent subdivision, which includes construction of sidewalks, curb extensions, and crosswalks along the property frontages, and consider concluding those same developments and public development plans for the property. Second. Second. Oh, second. <laughs> second. All right. Okay. Let's, uh, let's be clear here, Lindy. Your name is not on the second list. <laughs> Brent gotcha. <laughs> In the record. I was daydreaming. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere in that RPC uh, number 52 206. <laughs> I just lost Any it. discussion about this motion? No. This it's is awesome. A, great this thing. is a good oh, thing. The city's finally done. Yes. Yeah. There, there are many awesome. opportunities that have been missed, but this is one that. This is one where we're lucky <laughs> that. We're getting. So that's yeah. Good. And it's a beautiful use of seven columns. Yeah. All right, uh, can you take a roll call vote, Mr. Stoddard? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Puentes? Yes. Mr. Stevens? Yes. Mr. Krasner? Yes. Ms. Hockenberry? Absolutely. Ms. Teets? Yes. Mr. Rankin? Yes. Uh, Mr. Rodiska? Yes. I mean, I Great. wish we could have reversed the subdivision we had to do across from the library. For the record, absolutely okay, means yes. Uh, all right, we are, we are moving on to... We're moving on to 7B. These numbers are a little messed up from our uh, earlier the original, adjustment. <laughs> the original 7B, the uh, Planning Commissioner's reports. Would anybody uh, like to report on anything? Tim and I are at the EDC meeting where someone came and spoke about retail and what the, why it sometimes is not in demand. And I think the answer was, eh, 
you know. It's getting old and needs to be replaced, yeah. I think. Yeah. Is basically, yeah. Some of our, yeah, some of our older strip centers are having trouble filling, I guess, but he kind of said they're old, so they only... Which strip centers? Over by the bike bridge and... Like West End, where West End. where the Economy Party store was, and and also there's a store. federal real estate up there that got that it's not that doing well. Space. Yeah, federal. Yeah. Anyway, he basically has a combination of they're kind of older and you expensive know, things come and go. So right, it didn't. I didn't find it to be particularly enlightening, but <laughs> well, you know, West End is in kind of a down. No, but I think uh, thing right now, uh, he, Mr. Duncan was kind of looking for some kind of. I mean, he oh, did. You need to be doing this and this yeah. and this to fill them up, and I think he basically said, you know, it's probably not going to happen. But yeah. That I mean, he he said problems. what we've all thought, which is, if the, I don't know the names of these things, but the one by the bike bridge, if those guys could ever freaking acquire the right aid, then you'd have enough to redevelop Ooh, something there. Oh, or the carpet store. Well, yeah. then you'd toss that in there too. The carpet right. store just needs to be torn down and rebuilt. Well, and they did. I made one good comment. Right now, even though we've got the WNOD trail there, there's it, yeah, there's no access. You can't see it. Access yeah. that place. You can't see it. Yeah. I used to do it, but I had to, you know, ride my bike. Yeah, up there's no. And you don't. It has a very good visibility from the street. The retail visibility right? is so cute. Yeah. Without visibility, you'd be at the best. And it's so hard. You can't so only, only up down by the party store, and they have visibility. The other half, you really don't know what's back there. You have to yeah. know what's there. And it's uh, yeah. traffic right there. Yeah. Backs up, so it's yeah. hard it's to get It's only when the party store functions that a lot of people go there, and then start to go to Robux and some of the stuff that's in there. But yeah, it's all deep. kind of intimated that it may take until after, you know, it's redeveloped on the other side of the street. Right. There is a very cool escape room on top of that West End now. Above the Indian, Indian restaurant, and if you very good one. Bike it. Mm -hmm. Trail access. So sometimes poor, cheap space uh, gets you stuff. Was anything else brought up in that? I was kind of ran out of time. Um, the CACT had a new updated version of Letty Hardy's parking presentation. I don't know, Miss Starter, if you have a copy of it. Have you seen that? I, I can certainly get a copy. I uh, the last version. Well, I can I saw send was you one. Yeah. Well, parking, I can send it to you, but I thought if I send it to you, we could everyone might want to see it. It's just updated a few more things in it. Yeah. But well, the the ten, uh, ten parking spaces over in Park Towers. Yeah. 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 That's true. That's so. It just I think she's just continue. It's a continued mm -hmm. working right, document. Right, this right. parking presentation. That was so. a good negotiated situation. Yeah. Well, I think, sir, uh, if I could interrupt, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, I think one of the ideas is is to have uh, a mix of projects going forward at any given time. So you've got private investment in the city uh, turning over some of these spaces that aren't working anymore for, for one reason or another. Uh, uh, using the, the capital improvements program to, to make really uh, trend-setting investments like the South Washington Street investment, the Broad Street streetscape uh, efforts that were so successful in the early 90s, uh, using CIP for those big ticket items and then using spot improvements to make these functional changes like downtown parking, uh, like the striping that was done at uh, Park and Maple or the Park and Virginia sidewalk that's being talked right. about. When you have small pieces that need to be reserved or fixed up, going through a spot improvement program instead of the multi-year CIP uh, can be an effective blend. Right, and the stripings made a difference. Also, you know, I don't know how many people realize it, but across from Northside Social along Maple, there's 10 public spots yep. that are at the back of the Shinsky property. Right, right, right. Plus, there's five or six spots that are for that shopping center across the street from Minico Neko and Doodle Hoppers and all of that. But the sign is really hard to read because it has like a million things listed on it, but that's actually parking for that side too. And we really need I just to say have this a because. Color. Whenever I park, yeah. Whenever I park there, I find spots in those two sections all the time, um, and I think people just don't see them because the trees are there, and it kind of it's like a little dark spot. Okay. Uh, any other reports? Yeah, uh, just uh, one thing that might be of interest. It's kind of work in progress. Um, the company called EVGo won the uh, state contract through some of the VW settlement funds to put uh, charging station infrastructure throughout the uh, state of Virginia. And these are the fast chargers. These are the, these are the ones that can uh, recharge a car in half an hour to 45 minutes. Um, so we've kind of reached out and had discussions with them. And it's looking so far you know, like that we could put a couple in the city parking lot that's behind the Clarendons, uh, that there's plenty of space there for it, and uh, there's no cost 
to us. Wow. Uh, it's paid for both in terms of capital and maintenance by EVgo. Um, so anyway, it's kind of work in progress. There's a contract that uh, our city attorney has to look at and I'm sure a few mm -hmm. other issues here and there, but uh, we had uh, kind of an excellent uh, effort to bring all the parties together, Dominion, uh, the city, the appropriate people from the city, and um, uh, looks looks positive. I also reached out to uh, the Eden Center, and they're also very interested in possibly putting a couple of those uh, charging mm -hmm. stations there as well. So, more to follow. And then we always show up at the Sunday sessions, Kevin and I do. And I just bought, brought a little bit of that. Uh, this is a lasso magazine with all kinds of articles on development, on Founders Row, on what's going on with the schools, what's going on with commercial development, um, the little library and everything. And uh, the kids have been really interested in getting it, them out. So I know some people have already had it, but I brought some extra copies. They're really well written. And it's just nice to know that the kids are so interested in what's going on. And uh, Peter Noonan said yesterday they've been having um, different class meetings with about the school with all the kids. So, you know, the kids are really involved in uh, the, some of the articles are written by the one of the young men who's uh, uh, liaison or student representatives of the EDA. So we've got all kinds of info. So you want one? I know. This is this is. <laughs> hey, we don't have a student representative. You should read the thoughts right. and follow the video. I tried. No, no, they, they, they just come like once a month or something. No, they tell me that every meeting. Uh, well, they did come in this and They they do. They yeah. do. Yeah. We meet so much. Yeah. I love We've discussed it before. Um, and decided that it was not a good fit for our group, but it can be something we revisit. I mean, it's now been along, around for a long enough time that we have some track record. They're not a voting member. They just they no, they're not a voting right, member. Right, right. Um, but uh, we did think it was a big commitment for them and the time. And But uh, we can revisit it on January 14th. <laughs> um, all right, let's move. Let's move on um, to the planning director's report. Uh, so it'll be a, a brief report tonight. Uh, the uh, uh, let's see, staff is making good progress uh, on some administrative yeah. items as we come into Read December. It. Uh, <laughs> it is time for uh, mid-year annual performance evaluations. Uh, I'm happy to say that uh, a lot of positive reports uh, are going out. I, I have a sneak peek at some of the language in there. Um, I think everyone's doing very well. I think under some pretty difficult conditions, the temporary city hall. Uh, for anyone who's visited it knows that the conditions are a little bit cramped. Uh, we were rained out again today, uh, the rain day inside. Um, so we were, a lot of us were working from home. Um, but I think we've got some pretty good spirits. I'm sorry. What do you mean by rain day inside? Uh, the third floor floods uh, uh, when there's a rain event, uh, water's coming in the, the window units. Um, but I think Good thing this hasn't been the rainiest season ever. <laughs> it's been the, the wettest yeah. year on record, I yeah. believe. Yeah. Yeah. It's convenient. Um, we've got, we, 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 we've got more rain here in Falls. We're number one. At, at Reagan. So I have a rain gauge in my house. And <laughs> our, our recorded 76 inches of rain this calendar year. Um, number one. And it's so. all on the third floor. Fortunately, the group has been making really good use of that that uh, that tech fee uh, that was developed uh, and and folded into uh, the permitting process a couple years ago. Uh, has been a big benefit to get the group mobile. So uh, laptops, phones, being able to work from home, being able to work from other offices, uh, has been a tremendous burden. So I think everyone's in pretty good spirits that even when uh, we're having trouble in the physical space, we're still able to get our work done and be productive. Uh, and I really appreciate that as I went to um, 400 North Washington today because I had to drop something off and I was like, wow, it's, you guys are working in some tight quarters. I, I really, really appreciate horrible. all the work that's happening there considering the space. So when what? will it be over? When you get to the, uh, the current date that I've heard <laughs> is uh, March of uh, 2019. There will be a phased move in. Uh, I, I think that's a lesson learned from the move to 400 North Washington, that it's tough to move a lot of people on the same day. You're trying right. to get network drops set up. You're trying to figure out where everyone's machine went, someone's chair is missing, your file box went where. So I think moving in smaller um, platoons is a it's positive step. And when will we be back at the our, our Home. I think it would be about Dave, the same. Time. The Dave meetings, maybe. Mm -hmm. potential. Um, what was the reason for the pushback on the substantial completion date? 
I think uh, it's a combination of two things. I think it's the construction timeline uh, as well as uh, making sure that um, project management and the, and the city staff is moving forward. It's expected. There have been some recent uh, turnovers on the public works side of the uh, house. Um, I, I think, uh, as you may know, Jason Widstrom uh, has now moved over to Arlington County. He's now got a position in their Complete Streets program, which I think he's very excited about. Uh, and James Mack, uh, who is the city's, city's uh, deputy director, has moved over to a position with WMATA, uh, working on uh, um, uh, electrical, the traction power system. Um, trains don't run without power, uh, so it's good to have somebody like James working the, the, uh, through Metro's uh, investments. Uh, we've also had some other changes. Um, uh, Chris McGow, the city solid waste manager, uh, has moved on, and so I just—it's just been a number of changes on the public works side, and it's made it tough to, to keep all the projects moving forward. So the delay is on Falls Church side, not the contractor no, I side. Think, uh, uh, my understanding is that it is on the construction timeline and keeping pace. Okay. And there are. I'm sure rain didn't help it. <laughs> no, they have had a hard time. I'm I'm sure because of weather. The um, there are clauses in the contract about performance and timeline, and so Russell's there will be a impressed. conversation about that. Yeah. No. This is my, this is my business. So I'm just curious whether it, whether does not quite meet the standard of oh, okay, just push it back a couple months. Yeah. Um, it it rained. <laughs> Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, no, that's... And that's uh, yeah. Planning, planning is asking, having so much stuff being put out that the public works are probably having a hard time keeping up with it. Well, you mentioned the downtown park. I think that's actually one of those things, going back to that idea of spot improvements. Uh, the, the staff team for that, uh, actually Jim Snyder and Akita Ruzi, uh, along with Kim Callahan, are yeah. the, the sort of primary thinking uh, sort of brain trust moving that process forward. And so this is an opportunity to work across department lines. I think sometimes there's a sense of, oh, if we're thinking about the future, that's planning. And if we're implementing it, well, that's public works. That's not actually a very good model. Um, that you don't want to design something that can't be built, so you need an engineer in the beginning of the project, uh, and then you don't want to go and build the wrong thing, so you need a planner at the end of the project. And so I think this partnership uh, of recognizing that it's not a, oh, I'm a planner, or, oh, I'm a public works employee, but no, I'm a city employee. Uh, and so everybody working together regardless of, of title or department, I think that's well, a positive step. I worked from home on Friday, and I went to Minico Naco for lunch. And when I went by the downtown plaza, I saw Jim Snyder himself telling the construction workers exactly what he wanted done. <laughs> he was like, this, and the, you could see him. He was just walking through the whole yeah, site with them. They were always stuff up today. Yeah, well, I think he, he, they started on Friday, and so he was there. It was just, I was going by, and I'm like, is that Jim? And he's like telling him what to do. Well, I think uh, one of the things is that people are a lot more than their job descriptions. So uh, John Russell, who's on the city's uh, building safety side, he was actually the facility manager for Longwood University. And so he actually managed, managed vertical construction projects for Longwood for a number of years. Uh, Jim, uh, uh, back when he was a, a, a professor at Virginia Tech, actually taught an infrastructure program. So when we're talking about the West Falls Church site, one of the things that we're trying to get right from the beginning is how are you going to lay out your utilities in order to service not only this 10 acres that we're talking about, but also the other uh, 20 that Evan uh, Goldman mentioned in terms of the Wamada uh, uh, property, the Virginia Tech property, and what happens if Federal Realty uh, or the Gordon Road trying to come on board. Uh, having this blend of uh, some level of technical expertise uh, as well as sort of thoughts about the future blending together in one conversation. Yeah, I thought that was one of the potential risks he was going to mention, but he did not when I asked him. The uh, other things, uh, there was a mention of uh, charging stations. As the department builds up its operating budget for next year, uh, some of the vehicles that we have, uh, and I think this was a smart idea, we have some of the vehicles for building safety on uh, lease. Uh, those leases will be coming to term, and so we've got an opportunity to uh, move some of those cars uh, and look at uh, perhaps using a, a more electric oriented. Cog has a uh, contract to oh. kind of a. It's so odd you'd know that. <laughs> uh, any other, other reports? Uh, uh, items oh, I do for have report? One thing that I forgot on uh, 6B, the Fellows Property Acquisition, and that was to give uh, special thanks to Gary Fuller. Uh, I think uh, this idea of adding this item as, a, as an action for the Planning Commission came up uh, in City Hall sometime like Tuesday morning, and mm -hmm. I think the decision was made by around Wednesday afternoon. Uh, to actually add it to the report. And so between 
uh, Wednesday afternoon when we started talking seriously, adding it to the agenda, and Friday afternoon when we were able to get the materials posted in that short amount of time, uh, Gary was able to do research into the history of the property, uh, the, the requirements for planning commission action, coordinate with the city attorney on the required language, actually pull together the staff report, uh, as well as the attachments from the other reports. So it was really a, a tremendous effort by Gary to put that together, and I want to say thank you. Yep. Uh, the other item, if I actually just bleed into uh, 7D, the planning library. Uh, sure. Um, the planning library, uh, I am, I just want to say, uh, I'm really happy that you're going to talk about this. This was something um, we discussed earlier in this year, and uh, uh, I have talked to Paul on it, about it uh, on numerous occasions outside of these meetings and, and asking where that's at. I take exactly zero credit on this whatsoever, but I am really pleased that uh, the planning department was able to uh, make this a reality here before the end of 2018. So um, as you tell us about it, I want to you know, first say thank you very much for, um, th this was a priority for me and, and in the background and, and quietly you, you moved ahead on this and, and uh, I really appreciate it, so thank you. You're welcome. This was, uh, I'm glad we were able to deliver this uh, in the current calendar year. This was one of the Planning Commission's work plan items, uh, so I'm excited that we were able to cross it off. Uh, some of this is good people do good work. Uh, so Jeff Holleran, who I think, uh, who, who the group has met a couple times, uh, Jeff joined the city staff just a few months ago, uh, and in that short amount of time, uh, he was able to use some of the skills he was bringing to the city team to reorganize the city's web pages, uh, flesh out descriptions of planning documents, uh, find some of the documents in some cases that there, these documents were uh, arrayed across the city website, but they didn't always have a common look and feel. They weren't organized in a way that was necessarily intuitive uh, or linked up with the way uh, conversations about these documents happen. And so uh, Jeff uh, was able to pull that together in a fairly short amount of time, coordinate with the city's Office of Communication to get the web pages reorganized, uh, as well as all the materials loaded and launched. Uh, so the structure of the planning library uh, is the idea of sections. So there's a section for the city's comprehensive plan. There's a section for the city's master plans. There's a section for the small area plans. The speaker series that the planning commission has been holding, one of the ideas behind the speaker series was always to inform not only the planning commission but, but the community at large. And, and the idea had been out there to actually make these things easier to find. Uh, this planning library actually does that. Uh, as well as a place to consolidate all of the studies and reports that go on. Uh, certainly there's already been planning, uh, for example, for the West End that was done. There was a, a TLC, a Transportation Land Use Connection study that was done in 2017 that led to some of the early thinking about the transportation network up there. Uh, and that's something that's worth revisiting uh, as a uh, review of the applications go forward. But other uh, studies and priorities that have been um, uh, looked at in the past. It's always good to have those handy. Uh, attached to the report are some screenshots of the planning library, uh, and you can see it's a very attractive layout uh, showing uh, the different sections of the library, uh, and then having a consistent look and feel. So each document has a brief description of what's in it, and then links to the project page as appropriate, and then, uh, of course, the adopted document itself. <coughs> um, again, thank you. Uh, my, my only real comment at this point uh, and then I'll let you guys comment on it as well, is I'd really like to see this linked to the Planning Commission page as well. Right now it's it's entirely encompassed within the Planning Department, and I think um, if people are checking out our agenda and what we're doing that night, that uh, it's already in place on the Planning Department, it just needs a, a link. That, and maybe, you know, we talk about meetings right at the front, but maybe it's even on, on top of that. I think it's a, a prominent thing, you know, background information for the meetings. I just think there needs to be a link, and maybe it's not just a single link. It's a link that says, uh, he, you know, here it is to the planning, planning library, but also maybe those five categories that you have listed there, that those hi could be hyperlinked onto the planning commission page. Um, that's, that that, that, that's my only request other than that. I don't know if anybody else uh, paid any attention to this, but... Um, mm -hmm. No, it looks really great. I guess the only thing I wonder is, should we add another page that links to the zoning code related to development? Just because that's something that's asked by citizens a lot of times, like... They do ask a lot. You know, right, right. How come you can subdivide this property this way or whatever? Like, 
that way. I, well, and, and you'll say to them that's what the code says, and then they'll be like, well, where's the code? And then I have to look it up in the Minissa code. Mm -hmm. So it might be nice if it was here. That's rather daunting. Well, I can, yeah. you can find it. it yeah, right, but <laughs> it's, uh, might as well make it easier. And the well, ordinance is the implementation, so the ordinance probably should be you know, the plan is the plan, and then the ordinance is one whoever makes it out, so. Yeah, so just, I would, you have an add page there. Maybe we add that one page. Other than that, it looks really great, and I think it will be really useful because I do get people, well, just like that email I forwarded to you recently, I just, I hadn't noticed it. I saw it. I was like, oh, I wonder if anyone responded. And just to be able to send that link and go, everything you want to know, you know, about plans is right there. So. No, that's, I, I couldn't be happier with this. You know, just, it's, an, it's a repository for knowledge in the city. Well, so. I am happy that we have the framework up, uh, and, and it seems like everyone is satisfied with the framework. And I think it, it, there are some studies that have been uh, sort of lost over time, and I think mm -hmm. when we can find them, we can put them in a place where everyone will know to go and reference. So I think that's a very positive step as well, the recovering lost knowledge and having a place to help prevent it from being lost again. Right, and I think we may end up using it more than, you know, citizens might use it. And, um, and, and, and this has been true of a lot of things, and like, VPS has the same problem. It's one of the reasons why we revamped our website, because if we load all the documents on there, we won't lose them, where before right. they were in various people's hard drives. Right. Google Drive. <laughs> yeah, we, we have a Google Drive, too. Is the plan, for example, let's yeah. say the Insight uh, <laughs> plans, oh. would that be archived? <laughs> Yeah, the thought was to have a, a sibling uh, repository that would be for, uh, so this is really geared toward long range or future planning, uh, to have also a sibling geared toward uh, current or uh, planning or development review projects. Uh, so it would have information about projects and it could probably break them out by, uh, you know, it's what's open, active and running, what's under review, uh, what's been approved but not under construction yet. So you could get a sense of where are projects in the life. That would be very helpful because right now I'm you know, we get all these piles of paper, and it would be nice just to get rid of them. Right. <laughs> we could also include yeah. in there summary information Oops. about uh, uh, fiscal impact, typical development programs, so that people get a sense of how has development been shaped in size. Well, I assume the city archives, right? I mean, you guys, when a project is approved, you are, you're archiving the files, I mean, hopefully digitally, or not just an archive, maybe. When it only goes back. They're, not, they're, they're not up on the big, flooded third floor. Not, <laughs> under the window units. Yeah, that should be something that maybe is a long-term goal for the city. That's I don't know how you guys do your records keeping, but I mean, you know, so by law, you need to keep a lot of that stuff. Everything down to like our minutes, right? Needs to be archived. And yes. Kept. Right. Yeah. Um, so we have the required archives. Yeah. The uh, that'll actually be a cleanup item for the planning commission early yeah. next year is making sure we've got a complete set of minutes for this calendar year. But um, uh, archiving the files and coming up with a, a more standardized way of cataloging things. I think that's one of our internal process improvements that we're looking at. That yeah. uh, One of the things that's uh, great about having more people is that you can get to more work and more projects and more activity. Uh, one of the downsides is that that means you need a better filing storing system than, than right. uh, each person individually storing things. So uh, getting things off of desktops and into shared folders uh, and then getting them into the same shared folder, getting them with the same template and layout and projects. Uh, I think these are all things that we're looking at as we as we grow and become more sophisticated. You can find out that um, going back, you would, uh, looking for things and they reached a certain point where stuff wasn't there. We can always find things. Uh, and sometimes the information doesn't have to be in-house. Uh, there was a... Uh, there was a 2008 corridor study for South Washington Street, uh, and right. we were having trouble finding it internally, but it was a, a Council of Governments at COG study, and so we actually just reached out to COG, and, and they, of course, had a copy archive, so we were able to get that, and we'll be able to push that up on the planning library as well. Uh, so the question is now, to me, how do we market this? Um, and I mean, it's obviously not taking out ads in the newspaper about this, <laughs> but I think maybe it's something like, uh, it goes on our agenda. Um, it's something that, you know, when we put out some, you know, some documents or in, uh, in advance of a issue that we know is going to have a lot of public um, involvement, that there is some reference to it. I would, I would like it not to just be us in this room and, and all the fans watching at home um, watch, uh, 
that are aware of it. I, I think it's something that should be, you know, a footer for maybe a, a six month time frame or a year that says check out the planning library or something like that. Just small little things so that people are aware that it's there. Uh, and anything else we can do, um, I will make a. Uh, uh, I take that back. Um, whoever's making the presentation to city council about our year in review, I think should mention this. Put it in that forum. Say one of the one of the. This is one of the accomplishments, uh, and just get it out in that forum. Something like that, because I think these kind of things are important. That's the, that's really it's for the public, not just for us. So. I'll also say it's for staff's benefit. I know. Um, there have been times when there were community conversations about why a project looked one way or another and finding a place to store that uh, so that there is a sense of institutional knowledge that, that even as staff turns over, uh, there's an opportunity to save that information and make it easy to find. Look, I hope it's a living library. I mean, I hope, it, I think Mr. Stevens' comment's a good one as well. That, you know, as we have big projects, there's a, there's a repository for exactly this, the storytelling of how we got here, and, and not, not necessarily a narrative about it, but more just these are the documents that, uh, that you could follow through and say, here's the history of this, uh, this, this big event, and, and uh, here's how you find out the information, without having to go to every single meeting minute and trying to figure out you know, what those downloads are. So, Thank you again. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, anything else on the planning library? All right, let's go to correspondence. Uh, correspondence, as always, is not intended to be a, a discussion item. It's, it's for the Planning Commission's information. Uh, included in correspondence uh, for tonight's meeting, there was the invite that was previously forwarded for the event that happened yesterday. Uh, this was the Sunday series on the West Falls Church Project. And then uh, uh, two items, they were status updates on the City Council's items, the, uh, the City Council work plan, uh, which is a two-and-a-half-year work plan, as well as the, uh, the CIP update, which is uh, these documents are generally updated on a, a quarterly basis. Um, uh, sometimes it skips a quarter, but this is the most recent set of reports. All right. I was just, excuse me, I was just wondering, I didn't have a chance to really look at the, the two uh, reports from the uh, Planning Commission and the City Council, but I was wondering how they were balancing out and, uh, you know, and being good for each other. There's a pretty heavy degree of overlap. Uh, if you look through the City Council's work plan, uh, I think what you'll see is that oftentimes a lot of the work uh, for these sort of change agents versus, and that's really what the Council's work plan is focused on, is these things that are going to adjust city policy or, or reinvest or redevelop the city. Um, a lot of them uh, fall either on public works in terms of implementing uh, civil infrastructure, uh, uh, community planning and economic development services in terms of policy updates. Uh, so for things like the West Falls Church site, the uh, uh, small area planning process, the comprehensive plan updates, uh, these are things that are of course of interest to both council and planning commission. In general, the schedules for, for target delivery dates line up, but, but not always. Mm -hmm. You good? So yes. Um, all right. Uh, now we're on to uh, work session items, and uh, these are uh, these are going to be led by you, Mr. Stoddard. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, so, commissioners, the intent is not to uh, necessarily have these discussions tonight, but certainly that is possible. Uh, instead, the idea is to seed the conversation in order to have a, a productive uh, uh, and fairly yeah. My view is that directed conversation. You we're know. ready. We're ready for the 14th of January. As opposed, just you know, you tee it up, and then we have a chance to review them. So the items in the packet. Uh, first, the service survey. Uh, this is a look back at 2018, uh, and the idea is for staff to have a chance to uh, be evaluated. Uh, that uh, the service that you all are receiving from the planning staff and the rest of city staff is that what you all need in order to be an effective public body? And so there are. Uh, uh, sets of questions dealing with staff reports and package materials, uh, how the meetings are organized and set up, uh, and then also the pace of work that the Planning Commission is able to accomplish. Is it, is it satisfactory to the group, uh, or is the group looking to achieve more? Uh, and of course, answers to these questions could be used either to um, advocate for resources, uh, run meetings differently, reduce services, increase services, refocus efforts, 
uh, all those things are, are possible opportunities coming out of this. I noticed there was no name on it as the intent that this is anonymous. Uh, or would you like us to? I, I think uh, what I was, uh, what I had intended was that each of the planning commissioners would go ahead and send in the materials, and that way staff could could prepare a, a synopsis and distribute it as part of that January 14 package. Um, but if the desire is for uh, an anonymous survey, we could certainly set that up as well. Oh, well. I mean, if you're okay with it saying strongly disagree all the way down by my name, it's fine. <laughs> that's fine. I think that's just an invitation for coffee. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's All right. So do you have a deadline that you'd like us to turn this in by so you can process it? Uh, I think end of the calendar 13. would be fine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, four, the 14th at 5 p.m. Yeah. yeah, if you could uh, send a reminder, mm -hmm. that'd be great. We respond to nudges. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the uh, annual work plan. So the annual work plan, this is uh, something that the Planning Commission developed during their annual advance. Uh, I think that was in March, we said earlier. Uh, and it laid out a program of work uh, in a number of areas, West Falls Church being the, the number one priority item for the group, uh, current planning, uh, development review, uh, um, development applications, zoning ordinance and future land use map updates. Comprehensive plan updates, three chapters active, uh, and then uh, I fudged the answer a little bit on this transportation one. The idea was to have an innovation uh, panel and speaker series, uh, and I just took credit for all the speaker series uh, that had been held uh, to date. So I was focusing on innovation and less so on transportation. Uh, and so what's in the, uh, the middle columns uh, was the delivery schedule that was uh, developed as part of the advance. And then uh, what's in the far right column is the status of each of those items. Uh, I think the overall story is one of success in the sense that a lot of things are complete or on schedule, especially when you're looking at some of those higher priority items. Um, uh, even lower priority items uh, uh, still had a substantial amount of work, uh, whether it was exactly as intended in March uh, is uh, open to question. but. Uh, there is positive progress on a lot of these things and opportunities for uh, follow-up action. Uh, I think there are some highlight items highlighted in red, uh, and those were items that the group wanted to advance this calendar year, but uh, an opportunity didn't really present itself. It never will yeah. for yeah. Greenway Downs. Well, you know, I, I, Greenway Downs? I, recently, Downs. I spoke to a couple council people about Greenway Downs because I feel like it's the one thing we really should get done. And they were really interested in it. And I said, it really depends on your schedule. Can we get it on your schedule? I said, because we, but, and then I guess we have to do the outreach again. Yeah, I think yeah. there would be yeah. a community have to conversation start all over again. Uh, and a yeah. little bit of consensus building and probably some tweaks to the draft ordinance. And I think that's always the issue is, um, for example, even the, um, the text amendment with the, that was relatively straightforward regarding uh, intellectual disabilities, the language regarding intellectual disabilities, I think that took about four months to move through. Right. I mean, I understand that, and I, but I think this is a win-win for the council because they oh, could sure. be doing something that a whole lot of citizens would get a positive out of, and it's not really a negative on anyone else. So just so um, I'm clear on this, Paul, because every year, <laughs> multiple times we talk about it, it sounds like it's not just as simple as getting on the city council calendar. It's the staff time needed to do the outreach, tweak the language. So yeah, if this I were ever to happen, what would be the next step? Well, one that I had a personal experience with was, was the Paper Streets update, that we had had some conversations with the CACT, the Brecon Parks, uh, with the Planning Commission, and the advisory group seemed to think it was a pretty good idea. Uh, went up to council and they had some legitimate questions about how would adjacent property owners be affected, how many people really know about the impacts on their properties, uh, and we said, well, we, we as staff haven't held a community meeting yet, and so the response was, well, go hold a community meeting, and uh, there just wasn't the bandwidth in-house to actually uh, coordinate, advertise, hold, respond to a community meeting, and so once that was the direction, it just went to the bottom of the list again. Um, and so I think if we were to do that, we would have to go through those same sets of boards and commissions to, to uh, uh, refresh knowledge, uh, right. make any tweaks that were necessary. But see, I mean, we thought it was more than 14th, but see, that's a, you know, I mean, that's a structural problem, and it winds up, you know, we spent, we spent a lot of time on that, and then other people did too, and if it's just going to die for, the, for lack of staff 
resources. Maybe right. that's a budget issue. Maybe it's another thing. But you know, obviously, between you know you and Jim making priorities for the year, I mean, there, there are different factors that weigh in, I suppose. But um, I mean, that's a seems to be a problem that's been recurrent over mm -hmm. the years, and it's not like a new problem. It seems to be. Since, you know, right. Well, that's what I'm problem. trying to really pin down. Right. That's unfortunate, and it, but it winds up wasting our time. I think you know, we spend a lot of meetings talking about that. But even the paper streets thing, we, we spent a while talking about that. Right. Well, and, and actually, that was second or third time. Yeah, around. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and one of my concerns is like, we got this all the way to the finish line, and then it didn't, didn't get through the Greenway Downs thing, and now it all has to be restarted. Well, we, well, we shouldn't. Start all over again. We should even if we had the staff time, it wouldn't make sense to restart it unless we had some way of knowing that it would get to the end. But my point is that, I mean, I agree it's a problem, but like, what is literally the next step if it were to move forward? It sounds like. Somebody would have to decide that it it deserves staff time. Who is that? Wyatt? Is that Jim? Is that City Council giving that guidance? So I think uh, one of the reasons for doing this exercise of looking at where we got is to get a sense of what is the bandwidth of the group. I think uh, in the council's work plan, uh, one of the things that was pretty interesting about this year's the formation of this year's work plan for council is that. Uh, staff took a look at the previous two work plans and asked questions. How many items were on the work plan? How many did you substantially complete? Uh, and regardless of the number of items on the work plan, about 30 got completed. Um, and so I think this may be one of the first retrospective looks at the Planning Commission's work plan. And so the question is, how many items can you squeeze through um, the Planning Commission's 24, maximum 24? All right, but that's a great example. We could have squeezed this one through. This is, we weren't the bottleneck on this one. The right. Downs went all if the way we were, well, then someone should have told us. It sounds like we were more than happy to take it up in any meeting. Yeah. So I don't. I, I appreciate that look, but it yeah. still doesn't answer the question of what is the next step that oh, would I have think to happen. Oh, I think the next step for both of these would be to, to have one community meeting to go back and answer that question from council to 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 say, did you meet the community? What were the discussion points, and how did you react to them? I think it's a fairly straightforward. And then, and then, but could, but would it make sense to? Go to city council. Like, okay, if we do that, and this is the answer, can, will it? Will it? You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't want to do that and have them be like, oh, great, great, okay, cool, cool, and then a year later, it's gone stale. They haven't done anything with it, and then they tell us to do it again. Oh, I don't, I don't know that you ever know, right? It, uh, right, the pet bike plan is a great example. It was three years, and everyone thought it was great, and then the community meeting was held in the community center. And the, All right, so it sounds like if we really want to move it forward, <laughs> we push you guys. I don't actually care, but. I just find it annoying that we sit here and we talk about it so much, but we never actually do the legwork to figure out how to actually move it forward. We just love to complain about it. So to me, it sounds like next year, if this is important to us, which we'll decide later, we, we hound you in every meeting to schedule this, this meeting. Then once that happens, we hound council to make sure they take action before the meeting results go stale. Yeah, One well, thing we talked about uh, at the advance, the planning commission's advance, was identifying a champion planning commission member. So right. as a community meeting is held, have a member of the planning commission at the meeting to, to be the advocate, to be the spokesperson for it. So it's not perceived as staff, staff. who've dreamed up totally. this idea and, and pushing it on everybody. Yeah. Uh, it's, no, there's been a conversation. Staff is helping us with yeah, the yeah. mechanics of it, but this is what we want to achieve. Uh, I think uh, one strategy that might be good is to put one zoning update on the work plan and see what happens. I think uh, internally we were trying to have discussions about how do we keep all three of these moving forward, and we could move all, all, all of them. And so uh, in some ways, getting one right, learning the formula for it, I think uh, some of this goes back to the work of the, the ZOAC committee, the Zoning Update Committee. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of good ideas. The pie was so big that, that no one could... could um, could take on the whole thing. So instead, break it up, advance one, get get in the habit of updating the zoning ordinance, no. uh, and making these changes that people think are a good thing, and and uh, uh, go from there. I still think there's a situation that when it gets up to the top, when uh, the mayor and the city manager is deciding what goes on, you know, onward and forward, I think Greenway Downs was cut out. Yeah. And, well, I think and because of uh, fear of so many difficulties with it. Yeah, so that's a good example. If that's true... And, but we should have not realized that or been told that before. Yeah, yeah. So, so if that's true, it would be great to forward. have gotten that feedback so that next time we put it on our list, we know, like, well, this is not going to go anywhere unless those issues are resolved. So it's not just go have a meeting and... You know right. what I mean? Like, I, 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 again, I don't actually care that much about this issue. I care about our 
inability to actually sure. there's a, I mean, there's a execute on a plan. There's a process for this called the stakeholder analysis where you lay out a chart and you say, okay, who are all the folks that are involved? What are their issues that, they, the, that they're concerned about? Uh, does the, the process for the product account? Was there anyone opposed to agreeing with that? We didn't sign that one. Apparently. The, well, the public wasn't. A, the public was happy. We had gone, reached out to all the groups. We did all our things. We had one work session with council before the public stuff. And then we were trying to schedule a second work session to go to first reading. And it was around budget time. And we just, they couldn't fit us in for months. And then it just kind of languished. Mm -hmm. And so no, nothing was conveyed to us from staff. There was a particular reason why we didn't get a work session with council, other than the schedule was full, and so it wasn't it wasn't a priority. So therefore, it didn't go on the schedule. We were uh, one of the things that made the recent comp plan update successful is that we danced it through the meeting schedule. That uh, you don't want to do major things in the summer. You don't want to do things uh, during the budget votes. Don't uh, do things during so holidays. Structuring things um, around those council meeting dates was an effective way to get those comp plan updates through. Uh, knowing what dates you have to hit, and then being willing to set other things aside and being late on other projects to hold those dates. It's almost really like the only good time dealing with council is September, October, November, t until Thanksgiving. Because the spring is very budgety. They don't want to do big things in the summer. They don't want to do big things in December, January. Mm -hmm. And so it's really like we're in this window where if we want it, we have to keep, we have to get it set up so that it hits them in September. If we really want to get something non-budget, non-big project, like big development project. That's, other than that, it's not going to go. And so, I mean, I'm sure the staff recognizes that. There are strategies. Yeah. You also <laughs> want to watch for election years. Oh, that's true. Oh, yeah, because nothing gets anything that's... Well, well, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's move. Uh, let's try to wrap this up in yeah. four minutes. Four minutes. Um, we're on to the annual report to council. Yes. Uh, so again, Spectacularly. Good work. Uh, this is uh, the work of Shanna Schaefer. Uh, one of the things Very she nice. brought to the city was uh, some uh, pretty sophisticated uh, skills with InDesign. Uh, this is substantially the same information that the group has seen in the past, uh, but it's been dressed up with uh, graphics from recent projects, things going around in the city, uh, captures of, of the Planning Commission in action. Uh, I'm speaking, but no one's listening. <laughs> well, <laughs> in action, and... Uh, you are uh, holding court, Tim. I mean, look at this. <laughs> Lindy's holding her head. She's like, on. Oh, this must be an environmental so comment here. Three, <laughs> <laughs> is in one spot in one picture in a different spot in the next picture. Because There's they kept moving us back and forth. Rob, you're attentive. Thankfully, well I was done. not there yeah. that day. <laughs> There's a section in the back uh, that's left for you all to complete uh, on the 14th, and that is priorities that you want to communicate to council. Uh, this has been an, a pretty effective tool that the CACT has started using uh, in recent years that when they make the annual report to council, they, they come with, you know, a, a top five or top seven list, whatever it is, things where they think um, city should be uh, moving. Uh, it's how they were effective in getting the parking day event. Uh, it's, it's how they've made some, some noise about adjusting speed limits on, on residential streets. It, it got the play streets effort going. It's gotten continual funding for neighborhood traffic coming. So having that short list where you need support from council, maybe it is on zoning updates, uh, scheduling those in a timely fashion, whatever it happens to be. Um, there is a correction that was identified, um, uh, uh, thank you, Commissioner uh. Stevens. Uh, it's on page eight, and it has to do with the, the votes and the SOCANs and the, and the firsts for the various motions related to the um, uh, uh, zoning text update. Yeah, well, that's why. <laughs> uh, Melissa was just looking at what, the what? I didn't understand. Okay. Uh, Last item is yep. the rules of procedure. Uh, I've gone Great. through these. Uh, I think what happens to documents over time, uh, you see this everywhere, that uh, things get added to address particular issues that are going on, and then when you look back at the totality of it, it's become a, a document that's, that's become somewhat unwieldy, and so things go through this period of, of uh, expansion over time and then contraction back to the core needs. Uh, and so that's what I was highlighting here the in some of the comments. Effect. So yes, uh, of what does the Planning Commission really need to include in its rules of procedure? And what I was noticing was a little bit of confusion where it was um, uh, quoting pieces of code. Um, I think that can lead to some confusion about what is the prevailing document, and of course that's that's code, not the rules of procedure. Yeah, I uh, mentioned this a little bit on the third, uh, that this was 
coming. I don't know if you had uh, sent it out by the third, or I just had mentioned that I had talked to you and read your comments. Um, as you go through this, uh, much of this needs to be rewritten and shortened. So if we're you know, using this accordion uh, analogy, we need to bring it way back in. We are at 20 some odd pages here, uh, 26 pages, and this thing could be probably half that size. Uh, the, I mean, I've been on the commission for 10 years, so I'm definitely play a role in this, but sort of got a little full of ourselves in terms of what we need to put in our rules and procedures as opposed to letting the, the, you know, the actual documents um, do what they were supposed to do. We, we just kept throwing it in here and throwing it in here. And uh, it's time to make a, some big adjustments. So uh, you'll see almost the whole document is highlighted by right. Paul that says uh, delete, all delete super <laughs> superfluous. Not all the purples delete. Some of no, 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 no. Some of it is review. I think there are some good, I think this is, you know, the rules of procedure. One of the things I look at is, uh, is this helping citizens engage and understand the important work that the planning commission is doing and understand how to communicate with the group and what is in the planning commission? And helping some standards and procedure, I think it's good. Need, it's absolutely. It gives people consistency and what they know what to expect and mm -hmm. the role of the commission. Yeah, it just, we just, uh, I mean, we've yeah, just covered it. It's just gone, gone, uh, it needs, a, it needs a few minutes of review. Uh, normally, we just we start off and say, oh, yeah, it looks good. Why we, Nothing's really changed in the past year. I think it makes sense to address this uh, on the 14th. So One of the things that I really like, uh, I'll just throw out as an example of how the rules of procedure can be very helpful, actually, in the, the Northern Virginia Transportation Authority. One of the things in their bylaws is that it stipulates when they're building subcommittees, they're supposed to try and achieve a mix of representatives from uh, jurisdictions inside the Beltway, outside the Beltway, large jurisdictions, small jurisdictions. So the idea is that you're empowered to set up subcommittees, and so think about how you want to set up subcommittees. Uh, or, uh, you know, when you're reviewing land use applications, what are the priority issues that you guys want to tackle, or, or how do you want to go about some of these things? Yeah, uh, again, I, I really appreciate the review um, by yourself and the staff to, to get us here and have a meaningful discussion on the 14th about it. So. Uh, all right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, anything else we got on our, th our uh, agenda? I do not see anything. Just adjournment. Just adjournment. Anyone else? Anyone wants to talk about? Jack. All right. Uh, we're adjourned. Yes. See you next year.